only 6 a.m. But Dad already woke me up. Hurry up, LaDonna. A huge storm's coming. Poor households await the city's plan for food and shelter. Oh, then what's the mayor's plan for my food? But Dad didn't listen and just drove away without letting me have breakfast. Well, I'm used to this anyway. A little backstory. We came from a long line of politicians. My grandpa, my uncles, all worked for the government. My dad actually broke with tradition and became a successful businessman. But I guess the apple really can't fall far from the tree. Last year, he took a sudden U-turn and moved back to his hometown to pursue a political career. And he was elected mayor! Since then, he had no time left for me. Not to mention the judgy eyes I had to face at school. You look fine. It's not you. It's your dad's new policy they're whispering about. Don't mind them, LaDonna. What do us kids know about politics anyway? Here they are, Kira and Troy, my only friends here. In fact, Troy's even in a similar situation. His mom is the chief of police, but he deals with it pretty well. Have you been to the White House? Does the key to the city really open anything? Can you tell your dad to ban homework? Seriously, how could Troy stay calm before these stupid questions? And even the teachers wouldn't leave me alone. They always put me in charge of things. Please, just because my dad has great leadership doesn't mean I do too. As if I wasn't already swamped with chores. Once the last bell rang, I rushed to the grocery store. Since dad's always busy now, poor old me had to take up housework and it's frozen meals all day every day. But today he'd come home early for dinner, so I'm gonna throw a feast. Except, none of these tasted edible. What's the problem? I followed the recipes very carefully. Did I come home at the wrong time? No, Dad, a perfect timing. My apple pie's ready. You mean that smoking thing in the oven? Oh no, my only ray of hope has also turned to ashes. I immediately ran to the convenience store, grabbed all of the instant foods and dashed home. But Dad's already fallen asleep. He must be exhausted. It's always been him who raised me, as mom passed away giving birth to me. Now on top of that, he had to take care of this whole town. He needed a partner to share his burden, and I needed to be taken care of as well. Let's see, getting to know someone new with dad's hectic schedule would be impossible. So maybe reconnect him with one of his exes? From my aunt, I learned he had two ex-girlfriends. One is Jade, his old classmate who's still single. Two is Alva, no other information. Let's start with Jade then. Next day, I immediately told Troy and Kira about my master plan. That's my Aunt Jade. No way! It's faded! Suddenly, a group rushed towards us, babbling about my uncle being appointed temporary secretary of state. Jeez, chill, guys. They kept flocking around, making me feel suffocated. Panicked, I ran away, and as I turned the corner, a hand pulled me back. Calm down. You're safe from that crazy crowd now. Thanks, but why did you help me? I've been in your position. I know what you're going through. Just like that, I found myself comfortably venting everything to her. It must be hard for your family of two. That's why I'm finding him a wife. Oh, good luck to you then, sweetie. I have to go now. What a lovely lady. If only everyone could be like her. With Kira's help, setting up a date for Dad and Jade was a piece of cake. We both dragged them to the same restaurant, then cued some cliché matchmaking moments. Me and Kira quickly excused ourselves and monitored things from afar. They seemed to have a good time, but as we leaned closer... Huh? Inflation? Food security? Obesity epidemic? They've been chatting about politics this whole time? Dad! That's exactly why you're single! <sighs> On the way home, I constantly mentioned Jade, but Dad was nonchalant and switched the subject to his meeting instead. Ugh. Another one in 30 minutes. I'll have to stay home alone tonight. As he dropped me off, he added, Find yourself a boyfriend first before trying to set me up. <laughs> How annoying! I then called Kira to inform her that our matchmaking plan had failed, but it took her a while to accept it. You give up too soon. Is it because you don't like my aunt? No, Kira, it's because I know my dad. And if he said no, it's a no. Okay, now plan B. Alva. I did some digging and figured out the neighborhood where she lived. I'll go there tomorrow. So, here I am now, completely lost. Except, isn't that the woman who helped me at school? I rushed over and thanked her for the other day, but she seemed a little off. After a lot of persuading, she finally told me the cause of her sorrow. A tragic love story. His family are all politicians, so they can't accept someone mediocre like me. I'm so sorry, but I'm sure you can find someone better. She shook her head, saying he'd recently moved back to town and was still single. That got her reminiscing about the good old days. But sadly, he's seeing someone else. <laughs> Wait a sec. Is that a photo of you two? May I see? She showed it to me. My thought exactly. That's my dad. So 
You're Alva? Yes, but how do you know? Because you're my dad's ex. Just who I'm looking for. I shrieked in happiness, but strangely, she cried even harder, then hugged me. If that's your dad, then LaDonna, I'm not just his ex. I'm your mom. Hold up, what now? So, they were deeply in love despite my dad's family's disapproval. But when I was born, they got even angrier and kicked her out. Yet, this entire time, I thought my poor mom was no longer on this earth. Our reunion was cut short by dad's call. I wanted to ask him everything ASAP, but mom signaled me not to. Honey, don't tell Robert yet. Of course I look forward to our family's reunion, but I'm not ready to meet him. And perhaps neither is he. It'll be awkward for him and the woman he's seeing. No worries, mom. There's nothing between them. The only woman for him is you. Having mom beside me made my life so much better. She's a successful businesswoman, but still puts work aside to spend time with me. We went on picnics, shopping, watched movies together. And her cooking is the best. I devoured the grilled ribs in an instant. It's a thousand times better than frozen food. When I'm around her, I can be myself without worrying about the public's eye. I wish I could skip class every day to stay home with mom like this, but it's not that easy. At school, I excitedly told Kira and Troy all about my fun outings with mom, but they looked rather uninterested. Whatever, mom will pick me up later and we'll have a blast. Suddenly, buzzing talks from other tables cut off my thoughts. My cat eats faster than her. Indeed, our graceful princess. Guys, don't be fooled. She's in fact a delinquent who skips class all the time. Having a mare daddy is so lucky. If we did that, we'd be kicked out right away. Those mean girls always have something bad to say. I headed toward them to settle this once and for all, but my father's words echoed in my mind. LaDonna, everyone judges me by your behavior. Ugh, fine. They're right, LaDonna. You've been absent quite a lot lately. I... I just want to be around my mother. A good mom would never tell her daughter to skip class. Think about it. There must be a reason for your whole family to be against her. What do you know? They were the bad guys who unreasonably looked down on her. Then why did your dad keep in touch with my aunt, but cut ties with her? So, Kira was still annoyed that my dad and her aunt didn't become a thing? How petty. I walked off, but Troy ran after me. Kira's just worried about you. Also, you're living in the same town as your mom now. You'll have lots of time with her. So don't play truant again, okay? Here, I've marked the important parts we learned during your absence. Troy has always been gentle to me. He's right. I have tons of time for mom, but we can't keep sneaking around like this. My parents should reunite soon. I remembered the story of how my mom first met dad and got an idea. What's so important that you have to come here in this weather? I promised to help out a friend. Please pull over here and wait for me. The friend I was helping was none other than mom. I then waited a bit before telling dad to bring me an umbrella because it's raining too hard. Now it's your turn. Go get him, mom. And just like that, the romantic scene from many years ago was reenacted right before my eyes. My mom was soaking wet, dashed through the rain, then bumped into my father. My dad then bent down to help her up, looked right into her eyes, and dropped her on the ground? I was still in shock when dad charged towards me and dragged me back to the car. How did you know that woman? Um. I asked around. Just stop. Never see her again, got it? His extreme reaction was proof that mom really mattered. They'll definitely get back together soon because they had me, their special bond. That night, I called mom. She must have been really upset. It's all right, honey. I'm used to it. Your dad's family was... Never mind. Your birthday's coming. LaDonna, what do you want for a present? I just want you to be with me. Yes, sweetie. If only we could celebrate as a family. That's it. I insisted dad throw me a huge birthday party. I invited all my friends and acquaintances. When the party began, I stepped on stage and thanked everyone for coming. Lastly, the biggest thanks goes to the people who brought me into this world. Dad, mom, please join me. I believe you all know my father already, but my mother, Alva Garrix. The crowd began talking and pointing. Now dad has to acknowledge her. Please, it's a misunderstanding. Miss Garrix here is only an old friend and it seems she got along very well with my daughter, which is just adorable. <laughs> Let's toast to our little princess's birthday. Unbelievable! He's fully committed to disregarding her. As the guests were busy chatting, Dad pulled me into a room. Ugh, he doesn't have the right to be mad here. Old friend, you're straight up lying. Elva is my mother. No, she's a gold digger. Look, there's no time right now. When do you ever have time for me? Dad just sighed, apologized, then sat me down to tell me that back when he first started his business, it failed, but he didn't want to ask his family for help. Mom berated him, saying he was a dumb loser who wouldn't take advantage of his family's power. 
Unable to change his mind, Mom left after I was born. No, no, that's not it. I'm sorry, Robert. I shouldn't have shown up here. It's all my fault. I... She suddenly passed out. Panicked, Dad and I put her in bed. That night, I checked on Mom constantly, then fell asleep next to her. I was awoken by my phone's notifications, so I quickly went out to check to not wake Mom. Oh my, hundreds of articles about my dad came up. His old photos with Jade and with my mother were all over the news. The press was saying that he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Dad's bombarded with calls from dozens of news outlets. It's her. Only Elva has these photos. Dad, look! How could such a frail person do anything? Suddenly, I saw a figure at the door to Mom's room. Dad and I tiptoed over, then grabbed them. Aha! Gotcha! Huh? Kira? Kira claimed that my mom's very suspicious, so she had to keep an eye on her. I swear she's faking it. I heard her on the phone just now. Enough, Kira! You're out of line this time. I don't want such a petty friend. Leave! Kira didn't say another word and just left. So did my dad. The protest at 4th Street is still going strong? All right, I'm coming. It's always work, work, work. Do these strangers matter more to him than his wife and kid? The next day, Troy asked me to meet up at the park for some update. So I unloaded everything onto him. I can't believe my dad rejected mom just to save face like that. He's not making as much money as when he had his business. Why is he so dead set on this job? I used to think like that about my mom too, but then I realized that she wasn't doing her job for money or fame, but simply contributing to society. I now entirely support her because it's her life's purpose. It might be the same for your dad. What choice had lingered in my mind? It does make sense. If dad's all about glory, there's many other ways which don't require him bending over backwards day in and day out like this. Troy's always been understanding to his mom. And me? I've never been supportive of dad when he had to juggle between his job and me. When I got home, mom was nowhere to be seen, except a letter on the table. Mom said she's terminally ill and didn't have much longer. That's why she risked everything to be with me. But now her health worsened. She didn't want me to witness her pitiful condition, so she left. I immediately called her. It's dangerous in this abandoned construction site. Please don't come. I just need you to know I love you, LaDonna. I immediately knew where she was when she said that. I rushed over, but at the entrance, a scary-looking crew approached me. Don't worry, sweetie. They're our friends. Just listen to them. They wasted no time tying me up, then called Dad. As soon as he arrived, Mom dropped her act. Turned out, she planned to approach me right after knowing he was elected mayor. Her wish to rekindle with us was just to use Dad. But it didn't work on him, so she's pushing things this far. Sign here, and our daughter will be safe. Many people will go bankrupt if that's signed. Don't ever think you could fool me. You couldn't care less about your daughter? Or are you still counting on those useless cops? Ma'am, you underestimate our law enforcers. It's Troy and Kira, followed by undercover policemen coming from all directions. Turns out, Kira actually heard the calls Alva made to her accomplices. She then told Troy and asked his mom to look into Alva. Coincidentally, the police had always been after Alva because she's been involved in a scheme that gave tenants a ridiculously huge debt. She colluded with the former mayor and wanted to continue the scam with my dad now. Before she's taken away, Alva still cried and begged for my help. I was nothing more than a puppet to you, and now you're talking about maternal love? A scammer like you deserves to be brought to justice. After Elva's arrest, I broke down crying. She's my mother. That's the only truth among all those lies. Dad hugged me and said sorry for everything. It's all my fault. I just foolishly fell into her trap because I wanted someone to take care of us. I'm sorry, LaDonna. You went through so much because of me and my job. It's okay, Dad. Now I see how meaningful your work is. I'm proud to be your daughter. And you too. Thank you. I decided to sign up for a cooking class to better support Dad. And this banquet is the fruits of my hard work. But before he could even sit down, an emergency call came. He gave me a sorry look, but I gladly said, Bye, Dad. I'll save you some. I was a little bummed out. But it's his job after all. And if he can't be changed, why not learn to enjoy it? Moments later, these hungry hippos already came. But hey, this just came to my mind. How about Troy's mom? She's also single and would look great with your dad, right? Nah, I've realized he already has a love of his life, serving the community. He's very happy with his choice. So I'll leave him be, for now. That's right. Besides, we can't be family. At least, not yet. Really? You're from Korea? No way. You sound just like a native speaker. Richard jumped up in surprise as I told him I came from South Korea. Yeah, I'm 100% Korean. 
I answered him, giggling. <laughs> I had spent hours every day practicing my English. Guess it has paid off. But that was six years ago already. I'm Jenny, by the way, and I'm Korean. At the time I was 21, I joined an online English speaking club where I first met Richard, who never in a million years did I think I'd fall in love with. But that's exactly what happened. Ever since that very first class, we started talking every day, and the sparks between us were undeniable. He always mentioned how he wished I could be in the Czech Republic with him, and I found myself daydreaming about our future wedding. Okay, so I was getting ahead of myself, but he was just so amazing. After a month of talking nonstop, I realized I was probably going to fail college if I didn't start setting my priorities straight. But all I could think about was him. And whenever we weren't chatting, I was stalking him on social media. And every time I saw him tagged with another girl, I got so jealous. This couldn't be healthy. I mean, I hadn't even met him in real life. But still, we continued to fall for each other. And he even introduced me to his two best friends, Anastasia and Pavel, via video chat. But not as blossoming as my love life, I was failing miserably at college. I'd always been the one who laughed at my lovesick friends, and now I was no better than them. This wasn't right. Something had to change. So even though it was killing me inside to do this, one night before sitting down on my desk to work on my assignment, I just picked up my phone and blocked his WhatsApp, deactivated my Facebook, and all without letting him know. Yep, I full-on ghosted him. It was such a hard decision. Because that night, instead of getting anything done for the assignment, I found myself lying in bed with a tear-soaked pillow. It hurt so much, but I had to think about my future. My parents would kill me if I didn't get a good job. I couldn't let them down. Anyway, Pavel messaged me a few days later saying Richard had gone totally crazy and he'd never seen him this upset before. He barely ate anything and would drink all day. He's not much different from a zombie now. But I stayed unfazed. Bet he'd be okay, though. He was young and handsome, and girls were always after him. He'd get over me soon. And I'd get over him, right? If only it were that easy. I missed him every single day. Even though we'd been thousands of miles apart, he somehow always made me feel so safe, like he was right there next to me. What had I done? I had ruined everything. Ugh. Instead of wasting time overthinking, it'd be better to put all my energy into my studies for now. Right? And it worked. When graduation came around, I was the top student in my class and even got accepted on an exchange program in Australia. Without even thinking, I texted Richard to tell him the good news. I apologized for disappearing on him and said it had messed with my mind because I hadn't expected to fall for him so hard. I had just needed some time to finish my studies, but now I was ready to reconnect again. Well, he'd seen my messages, but there was no reply. It felt like someone had punched me in the heart. Hours later, he finally replied and said, Sorry, Jenny. I'll get in touch soon. Now isn't the best time. I couldn't believe the words I was reading. I could actually hear the sound of my heart shattering, but it served me right. I was the one who'd gotten rid of him. He deserved better. But still, I stalked him every day online, and then I realized the only way to solve this would be to fly to the Czech Republic and find him. First, though, I had my exchange program in Australia. I bought a new phone and got a new number for the trip to leave my old one in Korea for my uncle who was always complaining about his outdated phone. Those three months in Australia were awesome, and I got my mind off things for a little. I was ready to start fresh when I got back from the trip, until my uncle told me that someone had texted me on my old phone, but because he didn't know English, he didn't know if it was for me or not. I immediately checked it, and there was a message from Richard that said, Jenny, I'm so sorry for my last message. I miss you so much. Your smile, your eyes, your voice. I hope you can give me another chance. Love, Richard. OMG! Months had passed since he'd sent it, and the worst part of all is that my uncle had read the message, and so it said, seen. This was a disaster. Okay, but I had to focus on the positive. He missed me. Maybe it wasn't too late. I tried to call him, but he didn't answer, so I texted him and explained what had happened. He finally replied and said he thought I'd given up on him. I'd never give up on him. We then had a proper phone call. I am still thinking about you all the time. Why didn't you send me a Facebook message? The words tumbled out of my mouth in a rush, as if I was afraid I would lose contact with him again in any sec. Suddenly, he went all quiet, and then he told me he'd recently met someone, and that he hoped I'd understand and still want to be friends. I felt devastated. Why was it so hard for us? But in the end, there was no other choice for me. I just wished him well and hung up. All I could do now was move on. It was time to find someone else to date, Clearly, Richard and I weren't meant to be. My heart hurt, but 
I found a job and threw myself into it, giving it all my attention. Eventually, I got promoted, and after five years, I was able to help my parents pay off their debt. I even moved up to a management position. Of course, during this time, I dated a bit, but I couldn't make any of the relationships last. I just missed Richard all the time. I kept dreaming of us spending Christmas together. It was so frustrating. I mean, it had been five years, and we hadn't spoken at all. Why couldn't I just get over him? I occasionally went on his Facebook page, but all I could see was his profile pic that remained the same for years. I'd unfriended Anastasia and Pavel, too, so I couldn't stalk them either. For all I knew, he could be someone's husband now. Maybe even a dad. And yet, still, I never gave up hope that maybe we'd meet in real life, our paths would cross, and we'd finally get to be together. I couldn't stop thinking about this. And then three weeks before Christmas, I got a new following request on Instagram. I couldn't believe it. It was Pavel. And he was now married to Anastasia. This made me so happy. And he told me they were going on their honeymoon to Korea and hoped to see me. OMG, this was so exciting. I desperately wanted to ask him about Richard, but I was terrified to hear that he had kids or something. Anastasia messaged me too and asked how I was doing. I told her I was still single because I worked all the time. Hey, there was no way I could tell her it was because I was still obsessed with Richard. Anyway, the week flew by, and finally I was at the airport awaiting to meet Pavel and Anastasia in real life. They both looked so sweet, and I gave them the biggest hugs. After hugging them, I noted someone standing behind them. Oh, and gee, was that Richard? What was he doing there? I was so stunned I couldn't move. It, it was really him. Pavel broke the silence by saying, we brought Richard along for you, Jenny. Feel free to hit him, bite him, kick him, or whatever you want to do if, if you think he deserves it. Out of complete shock, I just burst into tears. It had been six long years of total silence, and now here he was, looking at me. I asked myself, could I hug him? But I didn't even get a chance to answer my thought because he ran towards me and picked me up in his arms, squeezing me tightly. Then he whispered in my ear, I'm so sorry, Jenny. Please don't cry. I'm here. I won't leave you. I promise. Could I trust him, though? I was still in shock as I drove them to their hotel, and then again later when I drove to take them out for some Korean food. I was nervous about hanging out with them all, but we seriously had the best night eating, drinking, and laughing. The next day, Pavel and Anastasia would start their honeymoon. So maybe then Richard and I would have some time alone together to talk about whatever was left between us. After dropping them back at their hotel, I was driving away, when suddenly I saw Richard running back towards me. He said he wanted to tell me something, so I pulled over and we sat down on a bench to talk. I listened as he told me that over the past six years he tried to date other girls, but it never worked out because I was always in the back of his mind. He said he'd spend most of his time working so he could save up to visit me or buy me a ticket so I could come and visit him. It had taken him longer than he'd hoped because his parents had got divorced and he'd been looking after his mom who was super depressed. A few months later, she was diagnosed with cancer and so he'd had to work even harder to help her pay for treatment. After three long years of fighting, she sadly passed away. And ever since then, he'd been feeling so lonely and sad. One day he asked Pavel to contact me somehow and when he found out I was still single, he was over the moon and decided it was finally time to come to Korea and see me. He said seeing me in real life had made him fall even more in love with me, which he hadn't thought was even possible. Then he hugged me tight and I couldn't stop crying. We spent Christmas together, just like I always dreamt of. And well, the rest is history. Here I am now, packing my bags to fly to the Czech Republic to see Richard. I can't wait to meet his family. And you'll never believe it, but we're even planning our wedding. The big question is, where do we live? Should I go there, or should he move to Korea? To be honest, it doesn't matter. As long as we're together, it'll be perfect. So it's true what they say. If something is meant to be, it'll be. Even if it takes a year or six. All I know is that I'm glad I had the patience, because I've never been happier. I opened the drawer, and aha, uh -huh, there it was. I'd been looking for this magazine for ages. But as I closed the drawer, I noticed something else. A photo hiding under the magazine. There was a woman and two kids in the photo. A boy and a girl. I was so confused. Hmm, who were they? I turned it over and there was a message on the back that said, This is my new number. Call me more often. I miss you so much. 
Suddenly my mom came in and I was about to ask her about the photo, but she got mad and started screaming at me to get out of the room. Never, ever come into our room again. Do you hear me, Aaron? We have private stuff in here. You know the rules. I, I was just looking for the magazine, I said, and quickly tucked the photo inside before running out of her room. Actually, I knew I wasn't meant to go in my parents' room, but I was doing a school essay on sustainability, and I'd seen an article in my mom's magazine about it a few days back. So I'd searched the whole house to try and find it. Eventually, I knew the only place it could be was their room. So I snuck in. Usually their door was locked, so I was in luck. Ever since I was a kid, I had been forbidden to go in there, but I had no idea why. Back in my room, I couldn't stop staring at the photo. Were these my relatives or something? Long-lost cousins? The boy in the pic looked totally like my dad. Oh no. Reading the note behind it again, suddenly I thought this could be another family of my dad. Do you know what I meant? Yes. What if my dad had a secret family? Maybe he'd cheated on my mom and had this whole other secret life. My inner detective was going crazy. There was nothing else for it. I had to get to the bottom of this and find out the truth. I searched online for the phone number and couldn't believe it when a girl the same age as me popped up. I started scrolling through all her photos and suddenly saw one of a young guy holding a baby and the caption said, Miss the old days of being daddy's little girl. This was insane. I was certain the young guy in the photo was my dad and I needed to talk to the girl ASAP. I messaged her and told her we were related. I even sent some photos of me taken with my dad to prove it. I was shaking when I saw her reply pop up. My dad never mentioned you. Not even once. That hurt me so much. I couldn't believe this girl was actually my dad's daughter too. Now, how am I supposed to break this news to mom? She'd freak out. I couldn't bear the thought of seeing this crush her. So, I decided to go clear things up myself first. A few days later, my dad was going on a business trip to Boston. Again. He was always going to Boston. I'd always believed he was just super busy at work. But now I knew the truth as my dad's secret daughter had confirmed she was also from Boston. I mean, of course she was. So I told my mom I was going to spend the weekend at my friend's house. And the moment my dad left, I jumped in a cab that I'd called and asked the driver to follow him. When we got to Boston, I saw my dad stop outside of a house and then glance around as if he thought he was about to get caught. Then he got out of his car and rang the doorbell. A woman came to open and immediately they started kissing. Then a young girl appeared and, yep, it was exactly the people in the photo. I was shaking so much, I actually dropped the money for the cab. It felt like my dad had punched me in the chest. I was so upset. He had this whole other family that mom and I had no clue about. I couldn't stand it anymore. Mom didn't deserve this. I walked towards the house and was so focused on what I was planning to say to my dad, I didn't even notice a van pulling up right next to me. Suddenly, everything went black, and I realized I had been blindfolded. A huge hand was covering my mouth so I couldn't even scream. I felt tape being put across my lips, sealing them shut. Then someone yanked me backwards and shoved me into some kind of car. Oh my god, was I being kidnapped? Why? Had my dad seen me and now he was trying to cover his tracks? This was like something out of a movie. They even tied me up. After what felt like a billion hours, we finally stopped and I was dragged out of the car into a cold, dark building. Someone took my blindfold off, but it was so dark inside I couldn't really see anything except a single light bulb above my head. The tape across my mouth was pulled off and I was untied. I wanted to run out of there as fast as possible, but I was terrified. Two men dressed in black were standing in the room and one of them glared at me and said, They think they can hide you forever? <laughs> Who are you? I shouted. Where am I? If it's money you want, call my dad. Please, just let me go, I said in what must have been the shakiest voice ever. Don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. We don't even need money. It's your parents we want. In three weeks, they'll be out of prison. 
And then they'll need to come here to get you back. Then we can really punish you for knowing too many secrets about us. I had no idea what they were talking about. Prison? My parents aren't in prison. You've got the wrong person. One of the men just laughed and said, It's been 12 years, and yet you still don't know about it. Then he walked off laughing his head off. What? What were they talking about? None of this made any sense. My dad was a businessman, and my mom was a housewife. This was all some big mix-up. It had to be. They'd locked me in that dark room. I tried to scream and bang on the door, but no one heard me. Or if they did, they didn't care. The next few days were some of the worst of my life. I didn't think I'd survive. Twice a day someone slipped food under the door, and I spent most of the time trying to think of ways to escape. There was no window, but there was a small air vent, and if I could just open it, I thought I might be able to crawl through and get the heck out of this disgusting, shabby place. Lucky for me, they'd given me a fork to eat with, and slowly I'd been using it to loosen the screws on the grid of the vent. Finally, on the third night, I waited until everything was dead quiet, and I got into the vent. I crawled through and managed to get out. I was at the back of some old abandoned warehouse, and as I stood up to stretch my legs, someone covered my mouth from behind. Oh, no! How had I got caught so quickly? But then I heard a voice. Shh, are you okay? I almost screamed. <gasps> it was my mom. How did you find me? I asked. But she just grabbed my hand and said, Let's get out of here. Then I'll explain. We climbed through a small gap in the fence, and then I saw a black car by the road. I started to panic again, but my mom told me it was for us. And then as we climbed in, she said to the driver, I got her, James. Let's go. It was only then that I finally took a look at my mom and realized what she was wearing. She was in all black and looked like a spy or something. Um, mom, what's going on? My mom bit her lip and said she couldn't hide it from me anymore. What she told me next was unbelievable. Turns out my parents weren't even my real parents. My biological mom and dad used to be members of this mob, but 12 years ago they'd been given an impossible task and they refused to do it, so their boss said he'd harm me as their punishment. My parents had no choice but to turn themselves in and ask the police for protection for me. In return, they gave the police some confidential info about the mob. Whoa, I was shocked. So, you're not my mom? My real parents are in prison? I felt like my head was spinning. How could my life get so crazy? Yep, they're in prison. Back then, the police stormed into the mob's headquarters, but the boss had managed to escape. That's why we put you in the protection program, because we knew he'd come search for you. This was too much! I didn't want such a dramatic life! Then I suddenly remembered there was more drama. Mom, um, I found out Dad was cheating on you, so I followed him here to Boston. Did you follow him too? I mean, how did you find me? This was so weird! My mom didn't look sad at all. She said, actually... He wasn't cheating. That woman and those kids are his family. You see, at the time, he and I were the only two people qualified enough to adopt you. So he actually left his family to fake our family life to protect you. It was all part of the protection program. But he missed his family so much. That's why he went back to see them most weekends. I'm so sorry, Aaron. We didn't expect it to turn out like this. When you didn't come home on Sunday, I used the GPS we set on your phone. And that's how I found you. Okay, my head was spinning even more. Not only were they not my real parents, they weren't even a real couple. This was absolute insanity. And all to protect me? Wow. And as it turns out, it worked out pretty well. Because by tracking me, they found the new boss's hideout. And now the police had arrived and he was finally being arrested. As for me and my family, we had to pretend to be a real family. For now. And actually, it wasn't that hard because I loved them so much and they'd sacrificed the past 12 years of their life to protect me. I'd be eternally grateful to them, and my biological parents would be out of prison soon, and then I'd be reunited with them. I don't remember anything about them, but they also sacrificed their lives to protect me, so they must be pretty amazing, right? Job hunting is so not fun, but my current job as a waitress isn't working out. There's too much standing around. I now have a blister on my foot. Totally disgusting! Ooh, hang on. This one sounded interesting. 
retired couple seeks a well-mannered female housekeeper to attend to their country estate, board and meals included. This job sounded like such an easy ride, so I called them immediately. And yep, they invited me over. So, this is their country estate. Jeez, it's basically a castle. The owner, Mrs. Harris, answered the door. She seemed friendly enough, and she gave me a tour of the place. I expected her to interview me or something, but in the end, she just showed me a bedroom, then said, I hope this room is adequate enough for you. You'll start tomorrow. My husband and I are away from home quite often. All you have to do is keep an eye on the place and play with our son, as he does get lonely. Huh? I didn't see anything about babysitting in the job description. But I mean, come on, how bad could playing with some little kid be? And who cares? This was the perfect job. They were paying me a high salary to do practically nothing. Not even cleaning or cooking, as they had many maids for that. This was over the top. Some people had way more money than cents. I needed to hurry up and move in. For the first few days, the Harrises weren't around, and I didn't see any signs of a kid. I mooched around the mansion and explored the grounds. Then one day I was on the third floor inspecting a funny-looking portrait when I heard footsteps behind me. Startled, I turned around and saw a guy holding a teddy bear and licking a lollipop. He was looking straight at me. Okay, weird. Hello? And you are? I asked. Fred, he said with a very childish tone. Huh? He was like almost 30 already. How come he spoke like that? Fred wants to play. He raised the teddy bear up to my face like an invitation. All right, I shrugged, then followed him into his room. Whoa, it was like a toy store in there. He wheeled a toy truck over to me, so I took it and made car sounds as I moved it around. He clapped his hands and cheered excitedly. I ended up spending the rest of the day there playing these childish games with him. Then when I looked up, I saw Mr. and Mrs. Harris standing in the doorway, and beside them was a cameraman who was filming Fred and me. They asked to talk privately, so I followed them out to the garden. Mr. Harris started, Fred is our only son. Past traumas affected him, so now, although he appears to be an adult man, he still acts like a kid. Now that made sense. And too bad for him, though. The story continued that Mr. and Mrs. Harris used to work in the media. A few years ago, they decided to record Fred's daily activities, then edited them into videos to make a weekly series on social media. Wow, a show about a man acting like a child? How strange. The audience loves watching Freddy. Mrs. Harris giggled, but then she immediately changed her tone. But I do worry they'll soon get tired of watching just him. I think he should have a friend. It will help the show, and it'll be good for Freddy as he'll feel less lonely. I wonder. She looked at me all wide-eyed. Noticing my skeptical look, Mr. Harris jumped in before I even opened my mouth. We'll pay you double. Whoa, what a deal! I mean, it's not like I needed to be an award-winning actress or anything to be in this type of videos. Most importantly, that amount of money was insane. Only an idiot would have turned down an offer like this, right? So I started being friends with Fred. We shared toys, played in the garden, and did all those childlike things together. To be honest, I found him really sweet, and I felt sorry for him. Whenever he saw me, he beamed at me, and usually handed me his favorite toy, and that made me feel good. So... Okay, the cameraman followed us around all day, but I soon forgot he was there. And I also never check out the final videos, as I found it cringy to watch myself. Then one day, the Harrises sat me down to talk to me again. Mrs. Harris looked at me as she said, You may consider Freddy as a child, but he is now a 27-year-old man, handsome and physically healthy. He likes you, and he has every right to date. Then after showing me several comments on the internet, they told me frankly that the views would be higher if I became Fred's girlfriend. So, is it some kind of real-life fairy tale? A kind-hearted girl falls in love with a mentally disadvantaged man? 
Jeez. But I'm not into him that way. I groaned, pulling a wry face. Darling. She touched my arm. It would only be for the camera. And it would make Freddy so happy. And of course, you'll be generously compensated. Mr. Harris added. Oof. That much money? Who could say no? And it was only acting. Besides, Fred enjoyed making the videos, right? They must have had millions of views for the Harrises to throw money around like this. So I quit hesitating and agreed. They handed me an improv script and told me to do exactly whatever was written in it. The more convincing my performance, the higher my salary. Oh man, not long ago, I didn't have a cent to my name. And now I had thousands of dollars in my bank account. I could go to college, get myself an apartment, etc. A bright future was ahead for me. In the first video, I sat down next to Fred, took his hand, but he immediately started a thumb war. So I gave up on the hand-holding and softly said, Fred, I love spending time with you. You're so sweet and kind, and I have feelings for you. He let out an excitable shout. Then he pretended to be an airplane and did loops around the room. The next few videos didn't get any easier. When I tried to snuggle up to him, he'd whack me with his giant teddy bear. And when I went in for a kiss on his cheek, he pressed a toy car into my face. That was why when I read the next script, in which we were going to have a romantic dinner together, I couldn't help sighing and rolling my eyes. But it was work. So I put on a pretty dress and walked into the dining room. It was decorated with flower petals on the table, and there was mood lighting. Delicious? I asked while he was stuffing his face. He nodded, threw down the silverware, and clapped his hands. Fred cooks for Lynn Eats! Fred chewed as he spoke, spitting food all over. Man, this was so hilarious, I couldn't help laughing. Then he walked over to me and hugged me tightly. Oh my god. He got food stains all over my dress. <laughs> I looked straight into his eyes and thought, yeah, I did like him as a cute little brother. Poor guy. If only he wasn't so unfortunate. Suddenly, I felt his hands tightening around my waist. Stunned, I pushed him back and feigned interest in my food. A huge amount of money was transferred into my account that month, but I didn't feel so youthful anymore. So I started going off script and doing things that I thought were good for Fred. I used his toys to teach him math skills. I read him good books, and I showed him how to make cupcakes. One evening, when I was walking back to my room, Mr. Harris blocked my path and scowling at me said, What the hell are you playing at? Did you even read this week's script? I tried pushing past him, but he grabbed my arm. You're causing our viewers to leave. I'm paying you less this month. I shook myself free of his grip and replied, Money? Is that all that matters to you? Then I rolled my eyes and returned to my room. That night, I ended up looking up the videos. In one of the older ones, Fred was in a suit and looked super uncomfortable. Every time he tried to loosen the tie or unbutton the shirt, a stick went in the frame and hit him in the butt. After a few tries, Fred threw himself on the floor and started having a tantrum. There were so many comments like, OMG, this is way too hilarious, and grow up, man, or don't, for our entertainment. Oh no, people were so mean. Fred didn't choose to be like that. The Harrises were using their own son to get rich by making fun of him. Poor Fred. I had to stop this. I packed my bag, stormed into the room where the Harrises were watching TV, and said, I like Fred, and still want to be his friend, but I'm not going to be part of this freak show anymore. I quit, and if you care about Fred at all, I suggest you do the same. I expected them to beg me to stay or something, but Mrs. Harris just snarked. All right then, if you want to quit, just leave. Why bother making a fuss about all this? Girls like you won't be hard to replace anyway. How ruthless were they? I was fueled with anger. So I left their dumb mansion immediately and didn't look back. And guess who is cooking in my kitchen while I'm telling you this crazy story? Yep, 
It's Fred. A few weeks after I left, I answered the doorbell to find Fred standing there. Crazier still, he was acting completely normal. Turns out the Harrises were neglectful of Fred, so he was raised by an old butler, like Bruce and Alfred. When Fred was 15, his parents ended up jobless and in debt. Fred told me, I wanted their attention so badly, so I started acting like I was still a little kid. But then his cute, silly actions meant his parents came up with their crazy video idea. They lied about Fred's age since he does look a bit older, then made him solo act dumb and dumber on camera for years. At first, I thought this would be a good way to help my parents overcome their financial difficulties. But I soon grew tired of pretending, and they had more than enough money. So I told them to stop, but they refused. Then he told me that the night I left, he got into a heated argument with his parents and told them he wasn't doing the show ever again. I don't know anyone else and have feelings for no one else. But you, he confessed. And whoa, turns out he's only 19. So I let him stay with me and, well, we started dating. Like, real romantic dates and a real romantic grown-up relationship. I still have a lot of money in my account, and Fred took all the money he deserved from his parents, then moved in with me. I'm starting college next month, and I can't wait. Meanwhile, Fred has found an online course and is waiting for the results from the new part-time job. Also online. Well, he's gotta hide for quite a while, since his face is all over the internet but our future together is really wide open this time. Now, excuse me, we have a dinner date to enjoy. This is a real life fairy tale, baby. Hey, Dan, how about we go to that Japanese restaurant I wanna try? Um, but my mom's expecting me home for dinner, Dan awkwardly replied. Again? I rose an eyebrow. Predictably, his next move was taking out his phone and calling Mommy Dearest. Mom says eating out is very expensive. It's your idea, so you're paying, okay? Excuse me? Did I mishear him? Unbelievable. So, through gritted teeth, I said, Forget it. I'm going home. Then I left him standing there with a stupid look on his face. Yep. That idiot was my boyfriend, Dan. He's in his 20s, but every conversation is still, my mom this and my mom that. It's so exhausting. At first, I thought I'd found a manly, impeccable man to rely on. Instead, it just goes to show you, you can't judge a book by its cover, y'all. It all started with me coming back to the country, and it was hard finding my feet here again. Also, I hadn't had a boyfriend for, let's say, a long time. I wasn't that desperate, but my auntie insisted on matchmaking me with this cute guy. I thought, why not? First impressions, Dan was fine. He'd just graduated from a prestigious college, and he seemed so gentle and kind. We spent a good time chit-chatting, so yeah, after that we started dating. It was swell at first. But then the abnormal details about him began to surface. We arranged a date at mine once. The plan was to cook a meal together, then relax watching a movie. But as soon as he arrived, he walked straight over to the couch and started watching TV without any helpful intention. I dragged him into the kitchen, passed him a carrot and the peeler. He looked confused, then stuttered, Er, but I don't know how. I tried to show him. But despite explaining it in great detail, Dan still fumbled to peel one lousy carrot. Then, yep, you guessed it, at one point he called his mom. Then he told me, My mom says the kitchen is a very dangerous place. I could cut or burn myself. We could go back to my place. My mom can do the cooking. I glared at his arms akimbo. Or or we can eat out, Dan mumbled. Only if it's on you, Claire. It's not my fault. I growled while shaking my head. Fine, then I'm not coming with you. Then I pushed him out and slammed the door shut behind him. What the hell just happened? Still, 
I told myself that maybe he was just scared, since he has never cooked before. One time we were in a clothes shop, and I spotted this shirt that I knew would suit him. It wasn't his usual style, but I insisted he tried it on, and ooh, he looked so good in it. Dan seemed to like it too, as he admired himself in the mirror, then said, It does look nice, but wait, can you please take a photo so I can send it to my mom? Well, she's the one who buys all my clothes, so... What? So now he needed approval from his mom before he bought anything? Jeez. Anyway, I took a couple of photos and he sent them to his mom. They exchanged messages. Then he turned to me and said, Okay, mom says you can buy me it. Me? My eyes widened. Yeah, mom says you chose it, so you should buy it for me. Wait, what? I literally froze for seconds. Speechless, I could only glare at him before I found the means to leave. Claire, what's wrong? Dan chased after me, but I ignored him. Okay, I admit that after a few dates, it was easy to figure out he was a total mommy's boy, but I told myself that it was sweet he loved his mom so much, and I never expected it to be that extreme. After that, I used the silent treatment on him, but he wouldn't quit bugging me. Then, he told me he wanted to take me out to my favorite restaurant as a birthday treat. Ooh, this sounded great! Perhaps he'd realized something and wanted to make it up for me. We were holding hands and walking toward the restaurant when we passed by a shoe store, and in the window display were the perfect pair of boots. Well, I'm a girl, and it was my birthday. I pulled Dan's arm. Danny, look! I pointed at the boots. I want those. I grinned from ear to ear. Okay. Dan replied blandly. My smile faded. I mean, they'd make the best birthday present. Ugh, since when did a girl like me have to ask for a gift? Why? Dan shrugged. You like them, I don't. My face reddened with anger. But it's my birthday. Dan scratched his head and forced a smile. Sorry, babe. Last night I spent my allowance on some new games, so I'm broke now. Pfft, I sneered. Why don't you ask your mom? And he unexpectedly went mad. Hey, you're obviously the wealthier one. How come you keep asking me to buy you stuff? Enough! I stopped dead. I have never, ever dated anyone as awful as you before. You're a grown-ass man, so stop running to your mommy every time you forget how to turn the kettle on or stub your toe. And why on earth do you still get an allowance at your age? It's over. Then I turned to leave without letting him have the last word. So freaking unreal. Trust me, to arrive back in the country and end up straight into this bizarre mommy's boy circumstance. But yeah, at least I was finally free of him now. It's been a few weeks since then, but just the thought of Dan still made me so mad. Ugh, I needed to get out of here and live a little. So I called my close friend Philip and arranged to meet him and some of my trusted guy friends at a bar. Cheer up, little girl, he teased. I know what will put a smile on your face. Our gaming group found this hilarious player. All we have to do is throw a few compliments his way, and he buys us all new items. Then, whenever we go out partying after a victory, this noob also pays for it all. What an ego. I mocked, congrats, bros. Wish my ex-date was also that generous. Then I rolled my eyes. He never spent a cent. Well, at least not without asking his mom for permission first. Philip laughed with a surprise. Hey, this noob's the same. He brags that despite being broke, his mom came up with the idea of matching him with rich girls so he can be covered. Hold up. That didn't sound right. I had a real bad feeling about this. Then Philip pointed across the bar and said, Oh, speak of the devil, and patted my back. A chill ran down my spine as I took a deep inhale of breath and turned to see it was Dan. And oh, he had a new girlfriend already. I quickly made up some excuse and bailed before they saw me. That night, I couldn't stop thinking about Dan's new girlfriend. Whatever Dan and his mom were doing was no less than scamming. So, I arranged to meet up with Philip at a diner, and I confided in him about my history with Dan and how I was concerned about his new girlfriend. Philip offered to help and said he would try and find out more information. A few days later, he reported back with his findings. 
Turns out, Dan and his mom had learned the Claire lesson. So this time with his new girlfriend, Lizzie, they were playing it differently. Dan, as his mom had ordered, took some sensitive photos of Lizzie. And now every time she refused to pay for something, he threatened to post them online. OMG! This made me feel so sick! This poor girl was trapped and were sucked dry of all her money. This was extortion, and I was going to put a stop to it. It didn't take long for me to find Lizzie online. I then dropped her a message saying I wanted to help, and we arranged to meet up in person. After hearing me say that I knew the truth, Lizzie burst into tears. I can't let those pictures get out, so I have to keep on being his girlfriend and pay for everything. She rubbed the tears off her cheeks. I had to borrow money, and now the interest means I'm in thousands of dollars worth of debt, and I still have no guts to speak out. Let's put an end to this. I slammed my fist on the table. Be brave, Lizzie. I've got your back. The day after Philip and I went with Lizzie to tell her parents, it was bad. Her mom started blubbering and tried to cover her face while her dad went furious. No one does this to my little girl and gets away with it. Philip replied, Too right. The bad guys are going down. We spent the rest of the day gathering evidence, including all of the threatening messages Dan had sent her and the receipts she'd kept from the extortionate purchases he'd forced her to make for him. That was when Lizzie received a message from Dan. There's this expensive restaurant I want to go to. Babe, take me there tonight or else. Love you, X. Lizzie replied that she agreed. Then knowing Dan was out, we went around to his house. We confronted Dan's mom as soon as she let us inside. She was frightened and eventually confessed that she didn't have a job and it was Dan's dad who provided for them. As a result, she spoiled Dan so badly that it annoyed his dad, so he left. Then she sadly blurted out, He didn't say a word to me. He just left Dan a note that said, Take care of yourself and your mom. I knew Dan would be miserable without his luxuries, so I told him to find a rich girlfriend to spoil him, and this time, she looked from me to Lizzie to make sure she would be too trapped to ever leave. There was a knock at the door. She looked at us awkwardly before she went to answer it. We followed her, and that was when we saw two cops arresting her. She bursted into tears as they took her away. I guess she thought she was a devoted mother who was doing right by her son, when, in truth, she went about it in totally the wrong way. She ended up going to jail, and her house was sold to pay off Lizzie's debts. As for mommy's boy Dan, as an accomplice, he ended up doing community restitution. Hey, this would probably do him some good, as he'd finally learn what a day's hard work actually felt like. Huh. Thankfully, Lizzie gradually got over this traumatizing event and was ready to start dating again. With Philip. Hmm. About me? Well, I'm still single, but I don't feel lonely anymore, as I have awesome friends. Besides, this way I have no guys bumming money off me. (laughs) Hi guys, I'm Chrissy, and my high school life took a drastic turn thanks to my crazy, overprotective mom. You see, my parents divorced when I was a little kid. I stayed with my mom, but she worked for the criminal investigation department, which meant she was super busy, so the house chores remained undone, and we lived off takeaways. Trust me, having pizza and egg fried rice every night isn't as good as it sounds. My grandparents could see that my mom was struggling to juggle her work and home life commitments, so I went to stay with them. I didn't mind this, as mom always visited me on weekends. Besides, grandma's meals are delicious. But then, mom switched departments. She went from chasing criminals to handling paperwork at the station. Due to these changes in circumstances, she had far more time on her hands, so I moved back in with her. It's only by living with her that I realized just how different she is to me. Talk about my opposite, as she's strong, fierce, and impulsive. Basically, she's like a man while I'm a sweet girly girl who loves wearing pretty clothes and watching cute movies. You can imagine my horror when I invited my bestie, Sharon, over, and mom was walking around the house in a skull print tank top, ripped jeans, and biker boots. She looked like she was going on a bike rally. Yeah, 
this was just her usual style, but I was expecting she would at least act normal for once when we had a guest around. It was so cringe. She was almost 40, not 15. Then, on my first day of high school, mom insisted she take me there and pick me up, as she was worried there might be troublemakers on the bus. Yep, I know, this was ridiculous. I mean, how delicate does she think I am? But I didn't want to upset her, so I reluctantly agreed. School's out, and I was chatting with my friends while waiting for my mom to show up, when we suddenly heard the sound of a motorbike engine coming toward the school. Me and my friends got excited and whistled as we thought a cute guy was passing by. But then they stopped near us and took off their helmet. I literally wanted to faint. It was my beloved mother. Oh, sweet Jesus, what on earth was she doing? My mom shouted with joy. Hey, Chrissy, get on. Then she held a spare helmet out to me. I swear it was like the whole school was outside watching us. How embarrassing! When we arrived home, I asked her where the bike had come from. She replied, What? Oh, you mean Eleanor? I just bought her last week. The weather is so nice today, so I thought I would bring her along. Yes, you heard her right. My mom named the bike after Eleanor Roosevelt. Unbelievable! The embarrassment didn't end there. Oh no. One day, my teacher informed us that tomorrow after school was a parent-teacher conference. I couldn't have mom turning up in a teenage rebel outfit, so I searched her closet for something mom-like. Nope. All my mom owned were t-shirts, ripped shorts, and crop tops. Ugh! So I went online and found this beautiful blue dress, then I told her to buy it. The next day after school, I waited for mom in my form room. All the parents were already there. Only my mom was missing. I was about to call her when suddenly somebody walked into the room. Oh. My. God. Someone, please knock me out right now. It was my mom, and you wouldn't believe what she was wearing. No, it wasn't the blue dress. Instead, it was this super skinny black leather dress, black sunglasses, 10-inch high heels, and a black choker necklace. She looked like she belonged in a vampire movie. Everyone was gawping at her. I think some of the dads were even drooling a bit. When I confronted her about it, she just shrugged and said, Sweetie, this dress is much more my style than that mumsy blue one. Now this was officially my number one most embarrassing moment ever. Thanks, Mom. Why couldn't she be like me? I mean, I was starting to think that I was the adult here, not her. The embarrassment didn't end there. Instead, she took it to a whole new level. My school was planning a camping trip, and I was so excited about it. Mom wanted to come along and supervise, but I firmly said no. She started saying, but honey, you don't know how dangerous the woods are. What if you got bitten by a snake? Do you know how to handle that? I don't think so. What? She was just being ridiculous again. We argued for a while, but in the end, she agreed to let me go without her. The trip was so much fun, and some cute boys asked Sharon and me if we wanted to go for a swim in the lake. Of course, we said yes. I mean, look at them. They were so cute. Suddenly, I heard screaming. It was Sharon. She said someone was hiding in the bushes and watching us. That was so creepy. The cute boys said they'd go and check it out, but then this person jumped out of the bush and did a judo throw on them. Wait a minute. I know that move. Could it be? Oh no. It was my mom. What was she wearing? She was in full army gear. She even had binoculars. Jeez, mom. What were you doing looking like a G.I. Joe? I couldn't hold my tears and I cried out, Oh my god, why can't you leave me alone? You're ruining everything. Then I ran back to the camp. She left after that, but I felt so embarrassed for the rest of the trip. When I returned home, my mom immediately said sorry to me and swore that something like that would never happen again. Okay, I could see in her eyes that she really meant it, so I would give her another chance. She calmed down a lot after that and even let me go to school by myself. Well, that was big progress, don't you think? Soon after that, I started to date this boy named Kevin. And boy, was he hot! 
he was one of the popular kids at school, so I still couldn't believe he chose me. I don't know how mom found out about him, but she did, and she insisted on inviting him over for dinner. I made her agree not to do anything crazy. I mean, what was the worst that could happen? The dinner was going well, until we got to dessert. Then mom started asking him awkward questions, like, Kevin, how many girls have you dated? And, I assume you two have health classes at school, or should I remind you of some important facts? Oh, sweet Jesus, Mom! Her questions were beyond embarrassing! Kevin just sat there with a super awkward smile on his face and didn't answer. But then Mom announced it was very late and practically shoved him out of the house. Huh, it was only 8.30 p.m. After he left, I went straight to my mom and we started arguing. Mom, you agreed not to do anything crazy! Why can't you act like a normal mom? She replied, Oh, honey, that Kevin guy is really cute, but he's not good for you. I know his type. They only want to take advantage of girly girls like you. What? Girly girls like me? What was that supposed to mean? I shouted back, You're doing it again! You're being overprotective! That's because you're not tough enough. If you wouldn't be so girly and be a badass like your mom, I wouldn't have to protect you all the time. I stormed up to my room and slammed the door shut. I was so going to prove to her that she was wrong about Kevin and that I didn't need her protection. Fortunately, mom hadn't scared Kevin off. Phew! He told me that his parents were super embarrassing too. One evening, Kevin took me to this nice restaurant. There were candles, live music, and the food was delicious. It was so romantic. Then he touched my hand and leaned in closer. This was so exciting. I was about to have my first kiss. Suddenly, someone banged on the table nearby and ruined the moment. That's when I noticed they had a keychain on their bag that looked exactly like the one I'd made once at summer camp. I stood up and walked toward the table. A middle-aged lady with blonde hair and sunglasses was sitting there. I tried to look at her face, but it was like she was avoiding me. I took a closer look, and I couldn't believe it. I ripped the wig off her head, and yes, it was my beloved mother, again! To be honest, I didn't want to argue with her anymore. Today was proof that she just couldn't change. So I just said in a calm voice, I hate you, mom. You're the worst mom ever. Then I grabbed Kevin's arm and ran out of there. Okay, maybe what I said was a bit harsh, but she just ruined what would have been my first kiss. I couldn't concentrate on our date after that, so I asked Kevin to take me home. But to my surprise, he drove me back to his place. Uh-oh, I knew what that meant. But I wasn't ready for any of that yet, so I told him I'd get an Uber. Suddenly, he grabbed my arm and tried to drag me into his house. I couldn't believe this was actually happening. Mom was so right about him. I was freaking out. But then suddenly, I remembered something important that she taught me, so I used her signature judo move on him. It worked, as he laid on the ground and groaned out in pain. Ha! Huh. And that's when my mom arrived on her motorbike. As soon as I saw her, I ran over to her, hugged her tight, and cried like a baby in her arms. You must be wondering how my mom found me. Well, when Kevin came by to have dinner, she pickpocketed his phone and hacked it so she had access to all his messages and location. So after I dragged him out of the restaurant, he texted his friends saying he was trying to get in bed with me at all costs, which my mom saw, so she rushed to rescue me. Oh God, mom, that was so not okay. But what could you expect from a criminal investigator? When we arrived home, we had a serious talk. To my surprise, she admitted that she was wrong about me. She saw now that I was able to take care of myself. That judo move I did on Kevin really impressed her. See, girly girls can kick some butt too. So from that moment on, things between us improved lots. Turns out, my mom isn't so annoying after all. I realize now that she's pretty cool, and all the things she did were just to protect me. Okay, so maybe she took it to the extreme levels, but she did it with good intentions. Thanks to my mom, I feel stronger now. You know what they say, I'm a strong woman because a strong woman raised me.
Although, one thing's for sure, I won't be borrowing her clothes anytime soon. Hey, Sally here. I'm 25 years old, and I love makeup. I mean, I really love it. I don't even answer the door barefaced to the postman. My fascination with makeup started back when I was just a little kid. My mom was a famous beauty blogger and even created her own cosmetics brand. Everyone from renowned models to Hollywood actresses wanted to use her products. Back then, the industry was different. It wasn't about YouTube and different media channels. Instead, people like my mom had to take different avenues to promote their products. I remember how amazing it felt to walk into a drugstore and see my mom's makeup on the shelves. But then, my mom's world came crashing down, and it was all thanks to one lame model. I knew something was up when my dad picked me up from school. He barely ever picked me up. Mom always did. And weirder still, he didn't say a single word to me. Then, I walked into our house to find mom standing in front of the mirror as she smeared makeup all over her face. My mom was a glamorous, perfect-looking woman. I'd never seen her look or act like this before. I remember just staring at her, not knowing what I should do or say. Then she started crying, which caused the makeup to streak down her face. I remember thinking that she looked like a scary clown. She seemed so out of control. In a harsh tone, my dad said to her, Will you just look at yourself? How can you let Sally see you like this? Then he covered my eyes and pulled me out of there. I asked him what was going on, and he sighed and told me how a model had a bad reaction to the products during my mother's live webcast, and now she was getting treatment at the dermatology hospital. She blamed it on my mom's cosmetics products, which meant that both the press teams and police were now involved. Now the beauty industry was boycotting the range that my mom had worked so hard to create. The next day after school, my mom seemed to be in good spirits, she took me for a milkshake, and we sang along to Disney tunes in the car. I thought that everything was back to normal, but then we arrived home, and she sat me down and said to me, Sally, you're going to be my model, and save this family. Then she filmed herself applying her makeup products on me. She turned to the camera and said, See, I dare to use my products on my daughter's delicate skin, because I know there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. The problem is that footage of a young girl having her makeup done is boring in comparison to the shocking pictures of a famous model with burned skin. All the brands turned their backs on her, and she went from super successful entrepreneur to blacklisted overnight. An investigation later proved that the model's skin damage was due to dangerous fake Botox injections, not my mom's products. But this was too little too late as my mom had already lost all her deals and partnerships, and the money spent on pricey lawsuits made my family bankrupt. After that, mom left the beauty industry behind her. But that afternoon changed my life. I always felt a sense of self-esteem as growing up in an environment full of famous beauties. But that day, after being put on makeup by my mother, I felt so pretty. I looked in the mirror and found myself like all the dream girls I'd seen from my childhood. My new, beautiful appearance made me more confident. Since then, I started practicing makeup, and this obsession doesn't stop until I grow up. By the age of 14, I wouldn't be seen leaving the house without a full face of makeup on. It gave me this added layer of confidence and made me feel ready to face the day. When I had my makeup on, then it didn't matter as much that my parents were now poor. I looked and felt beautiful, and I could handle the world. Now at 25, I still adore makeup. I'm a self-confessed makeup addict. Even my boyfriend, Chris, had never seen my bare face. When I stayed over at his, I went to bed with a full face of makeup on. Then I waited until he'd fallen asleep so I could sneak into the bathroom and take it off and moisturize. Then I woke up two hours before he did, just so I could apply my makeup, then get back into bed and look like I'd just woken up that glamorous. Yes, keeping up appearances was hard work, but when he looked at me like I was the most beautiful girl in the world, well, that made it so worth it. Only on one occasion, Chris woke up early and walked in on me doing my makeup. I totally freaked out and immediately covered my face with my hands and screamed out, No, don't look at me! I'm hideous! He laughed and said, Don't be silly. A bit of makeup doesn't change the fact that I love you and think you're the most beautiful girl in existence. This was sweet and all, but I still shouted at him until he left the room so I could finish off my makeup. His words got me thinking, though. Did he really, truly love me? 
We'd been together for two years, yet he'd never ever seen me fresh-faced. So how could he possibly know if he loved me if I wasn't wearing it? I couldn't stop thinking about this. I needed to know if he truly loved me for me or not. So I took all my makeup off. Yep, even my clear lip gloss. Then I tied back my hair and put on casual clothes and a pair of sneakers. I was standing right behind him at his favorite cafe. I hesitantly went to the table where he was sitting and was confused as to how to speak. That was when he looked up at me while still scrolling through his phone and said, Yeah, you can take that seat as I'm leaving soon. He didn't recognize me. Interesting. I sat down in front of him, pretending to be a shy, cute girl, and softly starting up a conversation. I tried varying the tone of my voice to ask what I should order, and it worked. He completely thought that I was just some random girl. After we chatted for ages, I said to him, I see you don't really have to leave soon, huh? He smiled and complimented me on being cute. It made me feel a lot more confident. So by then, I had the courage to tell him that I was his girlfriend. But suddenly he grinned and said, If you don't have a boyfriend, I wonder if I have a chance to get to know you? What? He was still in a relationship with me? Unbelievable! Well, another plan just popped up in my head, so I tried to stay calm and replied coyly, I'd like that. After that, I started living two different lives. When I put my makeup on and become energetic and attractive, Chris complimented me on how beautiful and charming I was, and proudly showed me off to his friends. But when I appeared with a bare face and acted all coy, he said that he loved how sweet and rustic I was, and that he thought girls who wore makeup all day were tragic. Tragic? How dare he? He would lie about going out with friends so he could spend more time with makeup for me. Then he kissed makeup me and told me how he loved how glamorous I was and how I was the only girl for him. Yeah, right. I couldn't believe how fake this guy was. There I was thinking he loved me, but now he was cheating on me. With me! A playboy like him didn't deserve any version of me. So it was time for revenge. So when he asked makeup for me to go on a trip, I shyly accepted. I knew he just wanted to trick an innocent girl into bed with him. But I'm not an ordinary girl anyways. As he was chilling out in the pool, I shyly said I would take a shower and wait for him inside. And I swear I saw his eyes brightened like a magpie. I ran into the bathroom to turn the shower on. Then I left a trail of makeup free me's clothes and then snuck out into the room nearby that I'd booked for the night. There, I transformed into makeup me, then got back ringing the doorbell. Obviously, he had to hurry from the pool to open the door, and when he saw me, he turned so pale. I walked in without his welcome, calmly walked through the luxurious room, and picked up every trace of adultery I'd previously scattered on the floor, the sundress, the bikini, and even lingerie. Then I threw them at him. He was unable to say a word and got panicked when I kept walking straight to the toilet, where there was the sound of a shower pouring water, calmly saying, the person I need to hit is inside, isn't she? He panicked and ran in between me and the door. It's not worth your action, honey. She's nothing. You know you're my only one. I asked him, is she beautiful? Nah, she's boring and old-fashioned. Not like you. I pushed him away and opened the door to enter. He panicked, jumped right behind me, and froze when his mistress was nowhere to be found in the hot shower steam. He probably thought she somehow escaped herself and, at least, saved his life. I still walked in, undressed, and put a bathrobe on myself right in front of him, then walked over to the mirror and started removing my makeup. He was still so bold and shameless. I completely had you fooled. There is no girl. This is my plan to bring you here. Let's enjoy the night, babe. He really had a talent for lying. I just silently removed all the makeup on my face. I've never seen you remove your makeup. Tonight will be really great, he said as he walked over to hug me from behind. I finished by tying my hair up and wiping the steam on the mirror with my hand and said, So, who do you want to sleep with tonight? He looked up into the mirror to see another me and screamed in horror, running away as if he'd seen a ghost. That night, I gloatingly stayed in that luxury hotel room and enjoyed the first day of my single life. Makeup is my passion and hobby, and I won't change it for anyone, especially for that kind of guy. But I now realize that I deserve to find a guy who loves me unconditionally, whether I'm the glamorous, makeup-covered version of me, or just plain, coy, makeup-free me.
Oh, my sweet little Jake. I'm glad you're back. I missed you so much. These were the first few words I heard from my mom after a seriously long sleep. But why couldn't I move my body? Oh, my God. Was I paralyzed? A doctor appeared and told me everything. Oh, Jesus. I'd been in a coma for five months. Yeah, you heard me right. Not five days, not five weeks, but five freaking months. The good news was that I wasn't paralyzed. I just needed some therapy to strengthen my muscles. So you're probably wondering how I ended up in a coma. Me too, so I asked my mom. Sweetie, you had your headphones on and you were singing along to some tune. You were so loud I could hear you outside while I was gardening. So I waved at you to quiet down, but you tripped over your sneakers, fell out the window, and knocked your head on the flower pot. What? That was so dumb. Why couldn't it have been something cool like I took on a mugger or tackled a shark or something, huh? Anyway, therapy became the norm for me. But where were my dad, my girlfriend Jenny, and my best friend Ben? None of them visited me, not even once. And they were all ignoring my calls and messages. I asked mom about it, and she told me dad was on a business trip. Ben had moved towns, and I'd already broken up with Jenny before the coma. Huh? We'd broken up? That couldn't be. I didn't remember us breaking up. In fact, the last thing I do remember was sending her a cheesy meme of a cat and telling her she was perfect. <laughs> Boy, this sucked. Finally, I was discharged from the hospital. My first stop was Jenny's house. I pounded on the door, and eventually she stuck her head out and said, J Jake? You're awake? Yeah, exactly. I'm awake. I asked her why we'd split up, and she shook her head and told me we hadn't. The only reason she hadn't answered my calls was that she thought it was a joke. Then she told me to go home, as she was busy at the moment, and then she closed the door on me. Weird. But at least we hadn't broken up. Maybe she was nervous. Oh, and she wanted to do her hair and makeup to look pretty in my eyes. Well, that must be it. It made total sense now. <laughs> Girls are weird sometimes. So I had school tomorrow, but I knew I needed to catch up on the happenings of the world first. So I went online and did some research. What? Pass me the tissues as I was about to cry. My favorite TV show, Supernatural, was over. For real this time? Oh my god. After 15 years, how could they? Oh wow, there was more. Trump wasn't the president anymore. And what's with all this dancing on TikTok? It all gave me a headache, so I went to bed. The next morning at school, I walked into class, and everyone rushed over to me and hugged me and high-fived me. Well, except for Ben. Jeez, talk about a lousy friend. But hang on, wasn't he of meant to move towns? So having my charm, good looks, sporting talents, and the hottest girlfriend in the school made me a super popular guy. No wonder everyone seemed so delighted to see me. It was good to be back. But then my teacher arrived, glared at me, and told me I was in the wrong class. I'd been pushed back to junior year because I'd missed too much school. What? I couldn't graduate with my classmates? Bummer. I sat down with these juniors and oh god. It looked like Dwayne The Rock Johnson was sitting in a kindergarten class. They all looked like little kids in comparison to me. I've never been so relieved for lunch break in all my life. I hurried to the canteen and saw Jenny, so I hugged her from behind. Huh? Why did she have a balloon under her shirt? I stared at her belly in shock. Yup, my girl was pregnant. She burst into tears and started apologizing. The room started to spin and before I knew it, I'd fainted. I woke up in the hospital. Again. I was seriously getting sick of this place. The doctor said I should take it easy and avoid stress at any cost. Oh well, I just found out my girlfriend was pregnant after I woke up from a freaking coma. Tell me how am I supposed to not be stressed now? After that, mom took me home. Dad was there. It was so good to see him. I hugged him, but he gave me this awkward look and told me he was only there to pick up some things. Huh? Where was he going now? And that's when my parents told me the shocking news. They were divorced. What? I mean, I knew they argued sometimes, but this was absurd. Something must have happened while I was in a coma. And what's with my dad's attitude? He barely looked at me. This was weird. It felt like I'd woken up from my coma in a parallel universe or something. Little did I know that it was about to get a lot crazier. The next day at school, I saw Ben's car pull up in front of the entrance. Then he opened the passenger door and helped Jenny get out. Oh, hell no. Now everything was clear. I ran toward them and did a Mortal Kombat punch right in Ben's nose. Damn, it felt good. But it did land us both in detention.
I had to sit in a room with that jerk for an entire hour. I couldn't hold it in anymore and needed to confront him. He just shrugged, then replied, We thought you were never going to wake up again. Jenny was devastated, so I took care of her for you. Was he serious? He took care of her by getting her pregnant? Huh, great job, buddy. There was no way I was ever talking to him again, and I was kicking him out of the basketball team. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that I'm the captain. The next day I strolled into practice and shouted, Yo, your captain's back, and he will lead this team to victory. I expected cheers, but nope. They all stayed quiet and stared down at their feet. Then the coach came over and told me I was off the team for a whole six months. Doctor's orders. And guess who the new captain was? Yeah. No other than my amigo, Ben. Let me get this straight. I was in a coma, so my best pal Ben over here stole not only my girl, but also my position as captain? Wow. Someone put me back in my coma, please, thanks, because this life sucks. No wonder my mom told me he'd moved away. I wish he had. I was so mad and I needed to talk to somebody, so I went to my dad's house. I was about to knock on the door when I heard voices between my dad and a woman coming from inside the house. I sneaked over to the window and started to film them on my phone. But wait a minute. This wasn't some random chick. It was Jenny. We can't hide this from Jake forever. Nonsense. He'll never find out unless you tell him, so keep up the act. Here's the money for this month. Now go. Oh. My. God. I couldn't believe it. Okay, let me put all the pieces together. My dad had an affair with Jenny and the baby was his. So my mom found out and divorced him. Then she lied to protect me. But dad didn't want the baby, so Jenny tricked Ben into believing it was his. Now everything makes sense. Luckily, I had the footage of his traitorous antics. So it was time to threaten him with it. After all, being a local politician, the last thing he would want was for this to get out. I set up a fake email and attached the video with the message, I know your dirty secret and I'm going to make you pay. He immediately replied that he would pay me $10,000 for the footage. I told him to meet me in the park at midnight to discuss it. I also sent the video to Jenny and told her that unless she wanted this to go viral, she had to go to the park. I got there early and spent a couple hours hiding in a bush while I waited for them. They looked surprised when they saw each other, but nothing prepared them for me hobbling out of the bush. Ouch, leg cramp and saying, Well, what do we have here? My dearest father and my loving girlfriend having a baby together. I took my phone out and continued. How could you do this to me and mom? I thought it's only right the world get to see this and learn what you're really like. My dad begged me to stop, but I was so mad. So mad that I was about to upload it from my phone when Jenny suddenly shouted. Will you just tell him the truth already? Oh God, there was more? My dad sighed and began to tell me everything. Brace yourselves, it's more dramatic than a soap opera. My parents didn't divorce because of Jenny. They had issues for a while, but only stayed together for me. So without me around, they split for good. But Dad wasn't having a fair. The baby wasn't his, and it wasn't Ben's either. Nope, it was mine. But Dad knew his son becoming a dad at such a young age would look bad for his career. So he was paying Jenny to fool Ben into thinking it was his baby. Oh my God, these people were mad. This was too much to deal with, so I ran out of there. I locked myself away in my room and tried to figure it all out. The coma had been bad. But the worst part of it all was that the people I cared about most in the world betrayed and lied to me. The next day, Jenny came to my house and asked if we could get back together. Of course I agreed. Ha! Huh, just kidding. My actual answer was, hell no, not in a million years. I mean, come on, let's do the math, shall we? First, she left me for money, and second, she had an affair with my best friend. We were over for good, but I will continue to support her and always be there for our kid. Ben tried talking to me a few times, but I don't want to hear anything he has to say. There's no way I'm ever being friends with that lying jerk ever again. I'm still annoyed that mom lied to me, but I guess I don't blame her. She did it with the best intentions. And she just wanted to protect me. Besides, when the going got tough, she was the only one who stayed by my side. As for dad, it's going to take a long time for me to fully forgive him, but I'm trying. I mean, he did some pretty awful things, but at the end of the day, he's still my dad. So that's pretty much it. Crazy, right? A coma took everything from me, but also revealed the true faces of the people around me. Now I've decided to follow two rules in my life. One, be extra careful of who I put my trust in. And two, never sing near an open window ever again. Hi, that's me, Maxine.
hiding behind some bushes and spying on a girl. Don't get me wrong, I don't have a crush on her, nor am I a total psychopath. I'm just doing a favor for my mate Damon. But if I'd known how crazy this was all going to get, I'd never have agreed to help him. It all started when Damon fell in love with this girl, Sophie. She had this mysterious charm that made him want to talk to her right away. And he did. She didn't even glance at him. She just walked away. Ouch. I didn't like her one bit. She was so stuck up. But Damon didn't give up that easily. He tried all kinds of tricks to get her attention, even waiting for the bus with her, even though he had a car. Nothing worked, though, and this made him miserable. He begged for my help, but I said, No way! Then he said, Aw, oh, come on, Maxine, you're a girl, so just befriend her or something. Maybe you can find out what she likes, her fave foods, music, etc. Then I can try to impress her. Please, I'm begging you. I'll even lend you my Nintendo Switch for a month if you agree. You can't say no to that. He had me at that. I'd do anything to get a Nintendo Switch. Fine, it's a deal, but don't blame me if it doesn't work. So after class that day, I searched for Sophie. She was at the bus stop, and I was about to approach her when suddenly she walked away. I decided to follow her, and on the way, she stopped to help an old lady cross the road. Wow, I was surprised. For someone with such a cold face, she had a pretty warm heart. Hmm, maybe she wasn't so bad after all. After that, she started walking towards the park, and by then it was starting to get dark. What was she doing? She sat down on a bench in a creepy part of the park, almost like she was waiting for someone. I hid behind a bush so she wouldn't see me, but I was totally freaked out. Suddenly, two guys appeared and started talking to her but they didn't seem like her acquaintances. Oh my gosh, she looked panicked. I had to help. I quickly shouted, help, officer, please help. There are two guys bothering us. Obviously there was no officer, but it worked. The two guys ran off and I rushed over to make sure Sophie was okay. She was surprised to see me, but then she hugged me and thanked me for saving her. Her whole body was shaking. She must have been terrified. I walked with her back to our dorm and she told me how she liked to come to the park at night because it was so peaceful. I told her it was clearly dangerous and that she probably shouldn't go alone anymore. Then we exchanged numbers, and after that we became quite close. Close enough. That was a few days later I told her Damon had a big crush on her, and asked if she'd maybe go on a date with him. But she just shook her head and said she wasn't ready. Her eyes looked sad, so I didn't push it any further, Maybe she'd just gone through a bad breakup? I didn't ask her again, but one night I was heading to her dorm for a movie night when I heard two people fighting. It was Sophie and some guy, and she was crying. It looked like the guy was about to hit her, so I ran over and said, Hey, what the heck do you think you're doing? Leave her alone or I'll call the cops. He just laughed at me and said to Sophie, We're not done yet. Then he stormed off. I asked Sophie if she was okay and who that guy was. Then she told me how he was her ex, and that he kept trying to get back together with her, but she wasn't interested. As she told me this, she started to cry and said, Because of him, I have become so scared and anxious. I'm even too scared to sleep at night. I felt so sorry for her, and told her I was here for her, and that she could call me any time. Well, Maybe I shouldn't have said that, because that's exactly what she started doing. Every night she'd call me, and we'd end up chatting until 3 a.m. I was so exhausted, but I wanted to help her. She seemed so anxious all the time. Damon knew we chatted a lot, but he'd stopped asking about Sophie. It seems he'd lost interest and was more worried about me looking like a zombie from The Walking Dead. You seriously need some sleep, Maxine. Leave Sophie be. She's clearly got issues. It's probably best to not get too involved. Easier said than done, though. But that night, I decided not to answer her call. I went to bed early, and when I woke up the next morning, I had about 20 missed calls and 50 texts from her. Oh my gosh! Some of them said she was so lonely and that I'd abandoned her. Then one said, if you don't pick up, then I will end it all. Okay, this was crazy. I immediately called her, but she wouldn't pick up. 
I rushed to her dorm, but nobody answered. I was panicking by then and bashing on the door, screaming, Sophie, open this darn door. But there was still no answer. I was terrified she'd done something bad, so I asked some students to help me bash down the door, and that's when she opened the door. I've never been so happy to see someone alive. I ran over to hug her, but she looked so annoyed. What are you doing here? You're making a scene, she said. What? I was so worried about you. You said you were going to... But she interrupted me and said, You need to get some sleep, Maxine. You seem insane. I couldn't believe it. After all those calls and texts, she was the insane one, not me. I didn't feel like yelling back, so I just left her. I needed some space. She tried to apologize to me over the next few days, but I didn't want to be around her. She even texted me saying if I wouldn't be her friend anymore, then life wasn't worth living. I was so tired of her threats, so I just ignored them. And then things got worse. A few days later, Damon and I were studying together when Sophie called me and said she was in the hospital. She told me that she had a brain tumor and they'd just done a biopsy to see if it was malignant or benign. I couldn't believe it. She asked me if I could pick her up and I said, of course, this was so scary. I told Damon and he just said, I think she's making it up, Maxine. How could she suddenly have a tumor? You guys just had a fight and suddenly she's in the hospital? Come on, think about it. I was shocked. Damon, how could you? You're such a jerk. Then I ran off and arrived at the hospital to find Sophie sitting outside wearing a hospital cap. She said her hair had been shaved off for the biopsy, and I asked to see the scar, but she wouldn't show me. She said she'd get a headache if she took it off. I was just glad that she was okay and gave her a ride home. We made up, and I decided to look after her for the day. She seemed so weak, I couldn't bear to see her suffering. I called Damon to tell him that he owed me an apology and told him about Sophie. And he just said, Oh, wow, okay, sorry, hope she's okay then. But then a few days later, he called me and said, Listen, Maxine, Sophie's a liar. She didn't have a biopsy. I bumped into her earlier and her cap fell off, and she has a full head of hair under there. No way it would grow back that fast. Why would she lie to me? I didn't get it. I needed to know the truth, so after class, I went to her dorm. She opened the door right away, and sure enough, she had all her hair intact. She probably knew Damon had told me, and so hadn't even bothered to keep up the lie. This made me furious. Straight away, I started shouting at her. Honestly, Sophie, what is wrong with you? Why would you pretend to be sick like that? Friends don't do that. Sophie grabbed my hand and said, Maxine, I'm sorry. I was desperate. I only did it because I missed you and wanted you to care about me again. I took it too far, though. Please forgive me. Are you crazy? I screamed. I was worried sick about you. Are you sure there's not something wrong with you? Sophie started grinning in a weird way and said, The only thing wrong with me is that I'm in love with you, Maxine. She wouldn't let go of my hand, and I just stared in shock. Wh what, what did you say? You heard me. I love you. Then she started to manically laugh and said, I've loved you since the day we first met. I knew you were following me, so I pretended to be in danger so you'd come rescue me. Even my ex-boyfriend was fake. He was just one of my friends pretending. Can't you see? I'm willing to do just about anything to get your attention. If that's not love, then what is? This couldn't be happening. I tried to stay as calm as possible and said, Listen, Sophie, I'm flattered. Really, I am. But I'm straight. I see you as just a friend, okay? But Sophie wouldn't give up. She grabbed my hands again and said, How do you know that? You didn't even try to love me yet. Just give me a chance and I'll show you what true love looks like. I tried to let go of her hands, but it was impossible. Sophie grabbed my hands tighter and tighter that it even began to hurt. She looked me in the eyes and, oh my god, it's like I couldn't recognize her anymore. She looked like a crazy person, like a psychopath. Then she began to speak in a really creepy tone. You can't get away from me. You're mine now. I was so scared. 
I needed to get out of here, so I pushed her really hard that she fell on the ground and I ran like a mad woman out of there until I was back in my dorm. Then I called the police, but by the time they reached her dorm, she was gone. I told them what happened and showed them a photo of her, and you won't believe it. Apparently, I wasn't the only girl Sophie had attacked. There were other girls, too. After that night, I was terrified. Everywhere I went, it felt like someone was watching me. Then one evening, after my shift at work, I was walking through the park back to my dorm, when I heard someone up ahead. I knew right away it was Sophie, but she wasn't alone. She was with some guys. They spotted me and started heading towards me. But I ran as fast as I could, and luckily the police were just outside the park and went in and arrested them. Sounds like a coincidence, right? Well, it wasn't. Sophie's not the only one who can fool people. I knew Sophie was stalking me, so I told the police, and together we created this plan to catch her, and voila, it worked. Sophie, if you're watching this, I wish you all the best, but let's not meet ever again. That's enough stalking for one lifetime. Have you ever questioned if your teacher hates you? I wish I didn't have to, but yep, my teacher hated my guts, and she went out of her way to make it very clear. I'm Lori, by the way. I'm 15 years old, and I guess you could say I kind of stand out because of my looks. People say I'm kind of pretty. Anyway, this year I started high school, although I only joined halfway through the year because I was off sick for six months with glandular fever. Yep, I had the dreaded mono. I was so tired of lying in bed feeling sorry for myself, so when the doctor said I could finally go back to school, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was in store for me. On my first day, I had to show all my teachers my hospital certificate to explain why I'd missed so much of the year. When I gave it to Miss Atkin, my math teacher, she smiled and said, Welcome. Nice to see you feeling so much better. I smiled back at her and said, Thank you. And I was about to walk away when suddenly she said, Excuse me, you're Lori Hannison? Her face looked all weird, and when I told her, Yep, that was me, Something inside her changed. She gave me a cold stare and told me to go to my seat immediately. I was confused a little bit about her attitude, but then I moved on from it. The most important thing was how I could catch up with my class. After missing six months of math, I was super behind and couldn't understand anything. My mom had to hire a tutor for me, and he was such a good teacher. Only after three months, I finally caught up with them. I had a notebook from our sessions with lots of notes inside, and whenever I couldn't remember something, I'd just look at it. Well, one day, I had it on my desk at school, and Miss Atkin caught me seeing my notes. She marched towards me, grabbed it, and slammed it down in front of me. She was so angry and got right up in my face and said, Never, ever bring another teacher's notes to my class. Do you hear me? As she said that, a little bit of spit flew out of her mouth and landed on my nose. I was horrified. Why was she so angry at me? It kind of scared me, and I thought maybe she was just angry because I wasn't as good at math as everyone else. After that, I didn't dare bring my notebook to class. But sometimes I still struggled, so I'd ask my friend who sat nearby to help me. Miss Atkin always caught me asking her and would put me in detention. One time I just sneezed too loud and she gave me detention. I mean, can you even believe? It annoyed me so much that I started to rebel. I'd often fall asleep in her class and I seriously lost all motivation to do well. And that's not all. One day I wore a new dress to class and I swear I looked exactly like all the other girls at school. But Miss Atkin publicly embarrassed me by making me stand up in front of everyone, then said, Girls and boys, Lori is a fine example of someone who pays more attention to what she wears than to studying. Don't be like Lori. I could feel myself blushing and I wanted to cry. She was deliberately being mean to me and I had no idea why. I was not that kind of girl. I normally loved studying, and I didn't care about clothes and shoes at all. I couldn't say anything, though, because if I spoke back to her, she'd give me a worse grade. What made it all even worse was that she was also the cheerleading coach, and she had her pack of cheerleaders following her around everywhere. One time I was standing in the hall talking with my friend Joe. We'd been best friends since we were like three years old, and we also live in the same street, so we'd grown up together. Joe always had my back, 
So we were standing there chatting when Miss Atkin and some of her fave students walked by. Suddenly, I heard one of the girls say, Oh, look, surprise, surprise. It's Lori flirting with a boy again. Then one of the other girls said, Seriously, she's such a fake. I mean, she's using her illness to get attention from boys. How pathetic. I couldn't believe it. Did they think I was deaf or something? They were the ones who were fake with their thick layers of makeup and all of their gossip and drama. I didn't really care that they were saying these things, but what really got to me was the way Miss Atkin laughed along with them. I actually saw her nod her head, so she agreed with them. I knew that wasn't okay, and Joe saw it too. He was so angry and grabbed my hand and said we had to report her to the principal. I stopped him though and said, just leave it. I am still the new girl here, and I don't want to cause any drama. And anyway, I have a plan. I smirked at him as I said this. So, Miss Atkin has this policy where if someone's phone rings in class, they have to answer it on speakerphone. And that policy includes her, too. So that day, I pretended to bump into her as she entered the class and watched as her phone dropped out of her hands. I quickly picked it up and apologized for being so clumsy, but at the same time, I unmuted it when she wasn't looking. Easy peasy. You see, I'd arranged for Joe to call her. This was going to be hilarious. Sure enough, five minutes later, her phone started ringing loudly. Her ringtone was Beyonce's single ladies, and everyone burst out laughing. She freaked out and quickly grabbed her phone to cancel it. But Joe was persistent. He just kept calling, and everyone in class reminded her of the policy, so she had no choice but to answer it. Well, just wait for this. She answered, and suddenly Joe's voice filled the room. But he'd put on a funny accent to make himself sound older. Honey, don't forget about our secret date at our favorite hotel tonight. Miss Atkin looked like she wanted to die. She said, who is this? I don't know you. Then Joe said, come on, baby, what's up? Is your husband there? Miss Atkin was now visibly shaking and said, you've got the wrong number. But Joe wouldn't stop. Ah, uh, you're so cute. I'll see you tonight, baby. Get ready for a fun night, wink wink. At that, Miss Atkin hung up and the whole class was just deathly silent. I had to bite my tongue to stop myself from laughing. Joe had really outdone himself. However, I hadn't exactly thought it all through, because a couple of days later, Joe and I were about to walk home when he got called into the principal's office. I went with him, but they wouldn't let me in. I could see Miss Atkin in the room along with the principal and Joe. She'd somehow found out that it was Joe who'd called her, and now the principal said that Joe would be expelled and that his parents would need to come in for a meeting the following day. Oh my god, this was all my fault. When he came out, I rushed over and started apologizing, but Joe said, Don't worry, I did it, so I'll take the responsibility. I was beside myself with guilt. I just kept saying, Joe, no, this is my fault. I'm the one who should be expelled. But Joe wouldn't even listen to me. Well, that evening, I told my parents the whole story. I was crying as I told them, and obviously they were angry, but they were also supportive. The next day, Joe's parents came for their meeting. The principal was there, and the school board, and of course, Miss Atkin. Luckily, my parents arrived just in time to interrupt the meeting, and we burst into the room. We told them the truth, how I'd been so ill and had to get a tutor, and that's why I carry that notebook. Then how Miss Atkin had treated me so badly and been so rude to me the whole time. I told them the phone call incident had been my fault and that Joe had just wanted to help me. Suddenly, Miss Atkin stood up and pointed at me and said, I knew it was you, you spoiled brat. You should be expelled. What happened next was crazy. My mom jumped up and said, how dare you speak to my daughter like that? You hate her because she's my daughter. Get over it, Angela. It's been years. Well, Miss Atkin ran towards my mom and said, you're a horrible woman. And so is your daughter. You deserve each other. She was about to grab my mom, but my dad jumped up and stopped her. I didn't understand what was happening. Everyone was so shocked. The principal looked so puzzled. Then he told us all to go home and calm down. When we got home, my mom sat me down and said, If you're being mistreated, you need to tell us. Don't suffer it out alone, okay? 
I told my mom I was fine and that school was great, but then my dad interrupted and said, you're fine? Don't lie to us. You were almost expelled. Then my mom said, honey, calm down. It's not her fault. You saw her teacher. She's a demon. Then my dad just laughed and I was so confused. Then he said, oh yeah, Lori, we should have told you this already, but Miss Atkin was at school with us. Then they told me how the three of them had gone to high school together and both my mom and Miss Atkin had a crush on my dad, so they became sworn enemies. They fought all the time, and Miss Atkin had been expelled from school because of my mom. Of course, my dad hadn't known all of that back then, and he'd fallen in love with my mom. Wow, now I understand the real reason Miss Atkin treated me like that. She was obviously still angry at my mom, and when she'd seen my name, she hadn't been able to control her anger anymore, and she'd just released it all on me. My mom said, Lori, you look exactly like me in high school. Because I was pretty, so many people were jealous. <laughs> then she turned to my dad, smiled, and said, I can see that Joe is quite similar to your dad. You should be careful. At that, mom and I burst out laughing. My dad was just speechless. <laughs> And guess what? It all worked out in the end. Miss Atkin got reassigned to another school, and Joe and I were only suspended from school for two weeks. Now we're closer than ever, and there's definitely some real chemistry between us. Finally, high school is getting good again, huh? I'd just finished my shift and was walking out of the coffee shop to head home when I suddenly heard a voice say, Hi, are you Catherine Mill? Ugh, oh, what else? I'm exhausted already. I reluctantly turned around to a view that almost made me leap out of my skin. Standing in front of me was a girl with a face exactly like mine. Who, who are you? I stammered. I felt like I was seeing things. She smiled at me and said, I'm Tracy. Is this wallet yours? Oh, wow, you found it. I dropped it at the Seattle Mariners baseball game. I never thought I'd see it again. That's right. We met there. Then Tracy took out a cap and put it on. Hang on. That hat seemed so familiar. And so did that smile. Um, are you the one I accidentally bumped into at the stadium? That must have been when I dropped my wallet. I was in such a hurry to get to my seat that I'd gone crashing into Tracy. At the time, she was wearing that cap, so all I saw was her smile. But now seeing her standing here, it was like looking in the mirror. I kept staring at her as she said, Yep, that was me. In fact, I came to find you not just to return your wallet, but because I need a favor. Can we chat for a sec? Um, sure. Let's go back inside the cafe. What favor could she possibly want? Well, I was about to find out. Catherine, I'm just going to say it outright. We have something in common, don't we? I hesitated to speak up, but I knew exactly what she was talking about. She then continued. I mean, look at us. You're basically my doppelganger. Which brings me to this favor to ask for. Kathy, I was hoping you'd impersonate me. I'll pay you, of course. I'll pay you a lot. Before I could even reply, Tracy handed me an envelope and showed me a photo of some very posh looking people. This is my family, she said. Wait, what? Turns out they were royals or something close to. Her grandfather had been an earl in the UK and then they'd moved over here to Washington. They're what you'd call an aristocratic family. So, yep, mega wealthy. Must be nice, I thought. However, it was suffocating Tracy, and that all of the duties that came with being from a family of nobility drove her crazy. Plus, one other little problem. She was in love with a guy that her family definitely wouldn't approve of, because he came from a normal family. Her parents had arranged for her to marry the son of one of the country's richest CEOs. And so that's what led us to now. She wanted to hire me to pretend to be her, so that she could be with her lover boy without troubles. I was stunned. What if someone finds out? I muttered and shoved the envelope back into her hands, saying that it was too much money. But Tracy just laughed. Oh, this is just the initial payment. You'll receive so much more. 
please, I'm begging you. Think about it. Then she looked at me with proper sadness in her eyes. I really did feel sorry for her, but I needed some time, and it would be better to get my mom's opinion on this first. Ever since I'd been a little girl, I'd always talked things through with her. She was the only family I had, and the only one I could trust and rely on. Mom would know what to do. When I got home, I found my mom waiting for me at the table. We ate dinner together in silence, as I could barely focus. She knew something was up right away. Honey, what happened at work? I hesitated, then handed her the photo of Tracy's family. My mom, as you can guess, was shocked to see how much Tracy looked like me, and so I told her what had gone down earlier. I explained that she offered me a ton of money to impersonate her, but that it felt risky. I'd assumed my mom would be dead set against it, but what she said surprised me. That poor girl. Indeed, how people always say it's not as fun as it looks being too wealthy. But hey, a bit of extra money in your pocket couldn't hurt. I mean, you could use it to pay for your vocal training. And at the same time, you'd help Tracy, so that she can be with her true love. Yeah, becoming a singer had been a lifelong dream of mine. But because of money struggles, I'd had to put that aside. Mom's right. This was my chance. I had to take it, so I called Tracy to seal the deal. She was over the moon about it, and we arranged to meet the next day to start preparing. I thought I'd just have to learn all of her favorite things and maybe borrow some of her clothes so that I didn't get caught out. But no, there was a whole lot more to it than that. For starters, I had to take etiquette classes. Can you even believe? That first day, I had lessons on how to walk properly, they legitimately did put books on my head to improve my posture. And then came the elocution lessons to teach me how to speak more clearly. Seriously, was this Princess Diaries or what? But the best part, though, was her wardrobe. Wow, her outfits were to die for. Now that's what gave me the urge to dive into the royal life now. Everything was going well until we sat down to go through all of her likes and dislikes. Her dislikes were about a mile long. Oh man, Tracy was one fussy girl. I mean, who didn't like pizza? I basically lived off the stuff. Plus, she was vegan, gluten-free, and had a nut allergy. What did she even eat? But despite that, we got through the week. Every morning I had my etiquette classes, which now were easy peasy. I could totally pull it off as a high society girl. And then in the afternoons, I hung with Tracy and learned everything I could about her. By the end of the week, we got all things set and ready for the swap. So Tracy and I went out to celebrate. Catherine, look at our faces, she said while squinting her eyes. I took a closer look at the phone screen and gotta admit, despite being pretty identical, there were still some differences between us. Sure. Her cheekbones were more prominent, and her nose was slightly upturned, but with a bit of makeup, I could fix that, right? Tracy wasn't convinced, though. Listen, I think you're going to need to get plastic surgery. Wait, I wasn't ready for any of that. But on second thought, I guess that would be all right, as it'd only make me prettier, which would totally help with my singing career. So I went under the knife. Not only my nose and cheekbones were fixed, but they also added a birthmark to my shoulder to match the one Tracy had. I looked like an Egyptian mummy with all my bandages on, coming out of the operating room. But when the day came to remove them, I was amazed. Just a little touch-up could make me look this incredible. I twirled around in front of the mirror in one of Tracy's glitzy dresses and just smiled. We were totally going to pull this off. Tracy was even more excited than me. She turned to me and said, Ready for the family party? Oh, wow. So my first mission had arrived already. I nervously looked at Tracy, and she just giggled and said, Oh, don't be nervous. It's just my cousin's baby's first birthday party. No big deal. Although, Thomas's whole family will be there. That's the family I'm meant to marry into. Okay, now I was even more worried. Tracy told me to simply do what I learned in the classes. As for Thomas, she instructed me to just ignore him, as that's what she usually did. 
He was used to the cold shoulder. <laughs> well, the moment I arrived at the party, I was already so overwhelmed. I couldn't believe my eyes. Her cousin's house was basically a palace with butlers and a grand staircase as you entered, just like in the movies. I almost had to pinch myself that I was even there. As I walked in, one of the butlers asked me to follow him through to the banquet hall. A banquet hall? How insane! There were crystal chandeliers hanging from every part of the ceiling, and the room looked like it was literally made from gold. I noticed Tracy's dad standing in the middle of the room with a young couple and a baby. That would be Tracy's cousin, and the baby was obviously the reason this insane party had been thrown. I took a deep breath, gathered myself, and walked towards them in the way my etiquette teacher had taught me. I greeted them casually, and it seemed no one sensed anything weird. Not even Tracy's dad. However, I was still afraid someone would realize. So I grabbed a glass of wine and went to stand in the corner just to be safe. While I was fiddling with the glass and trying not to make eye contact with anyone, a guy came up to me and clinked my glass. Oh boy! The coolest, most handsome guy ever was standing there grinning at me. I smiled back at him politely, trying not to blush. And then I realized, wasn't he Thomas and Tracy, the happy couple? Suddenly, I heard Tracy's dad from a few feet away, speaking towards us. You two look exquisite together. Be good to him now, Tracy, won't you? Yep, it's Thomas the fiancé that Tracy doesn't like at all. Okay, so I need to act cold towards him, otherwise I'll ruin everything for Tracy. But heck, he was just so good looking. I quickly walked away towards the dessert table and started stuffing my face with some almond cookies, anything to distract myself from Thomas. As I picked up a third one, I heard Thomas scream, and the next moment he was running over to me shouting, Tracy, put it down! There are nuts in those! I dropped the cookie in shock. Right. I was supposed to be allergic to these delicious snacks. Totally forgot that. Gosh, I turned around to see all eyes were on me. This was a disaster. I was like a deer in the headlights. Didn't know what else to do. I pretended to faint. Thomas immediately carried me somewhere while others called the family doctor. I only took a peek when I felt like I was let down on a bed. And wow, even their guest room is gorgeous. Anyway, the doctor did some quick checkup and said I was okay. Well, obviously. Then Thomas rushed over, holding my hand and kept saying, Thank God you're okay, baby. Really? How come Tracy didn't like him? He was so sweet. He was looking at me so lovingly. Wait, at Tracy, actually. Oh boy. This was getting weird. Guess I have started off this mission on the wrong foot. But having that first incident actually helped me become more careful, so I've been getting better and better at playing Tracy. I was like a secret agent that would be summoned by duty at any sec. Sometimes you'd find me as a princess, other times I'd be waiting tables. My life was getting busier, but much more fun in some senses. Then one day, Tracy suddenly appeared at my door, looking all loved up. How strange it was. Usually she only contacted me over the phone. Then she said, Kathy, I have a big mission for you. As she sat down, she put a bulging envelope on the table and said, Kathy, sweetie, I need a big favor this time. So here's the thing. Me and Arnold are going to Asia for a month. And, um, I was wondering if you could maybe move into my house and cover for me? I was shocked. A month? Um, that's quite a long time. I mean, surely I'll get caught. Oh, I'm not sure, Tracy. I tried to avoid her eye contact, but she kept begging and looking like she was about to cry. Oh, God, what should I do? Guys, please give me some advice. And stay tuned. I'll be back with part two to tell you how things go down. <sighs> Why do I have uneasy feelings about all this? Hi there, I'm Anita, a science pro and robotics prodigy. I've won countless trophies, including one for making a talking replica of BB-8. 
But it's my crush's heart that I can't win. Tom has just refused to accompany me to the last middle school dance. But who cares? I've got my bestie Barb. It'll still be fun. We can go together. We arrived at the dance to find that everyone had dates, except for us. Well, this is a little awkward. Move. This is a dance floor, grannies. Either you dance or get out. I bet this is the first party you've ever got to attend. As if Tom would go out with such a loser. Yeah, you should try asking your robots out instead. As they walked off laughing, I felt so disheartened. Barb told me not to listen to them, but their words niggled away at me. I realized if I didn't change, then I'd waste the rest of my teen years by being a loser that got left out of all the fun. I needed to reinvent myself now before it was too late. Over the summer break, I thought it over and realized that there was only one way forward. I should flip the script, where nobody knew who I was. And this is the perfect occasion for that. High school! I purposely chose a school that's across the city. It's a bit inconvenient, but that's how to be sure I'd not run into anyone from my local middle school. Of course, except for Barb. She's going there with me also. Hey, recognize me? I'm still Anita. Like my new look? I've had a style update, ditched my glasses and all the uncool geeky stuff. Ooh, let's surprise my bestie. <laughs> Anita? Whoa, talk about a Captain Marvel transformation. Gee, thanks. This hair color is so in season right now. Hang on, you look just like Chelsea. Oh, do I? How funny. You sound like her too. Okay, so Chelsea was this popular girl from middle school. Um, yeah, I may have spent all summer studying her. All right, I actually mirrored her style and mannerisms. I'm just learning to better myself. This isn't any different from using humans as models when programming a robot. Besides, it's not like Chelsea's here to mind. Speaking of robots, how's your BB-8? No, that's my past. We'll never be cool and get boyfriends if our peers think we're nerds. Come with me after school. I'll give you a makeover too. It's okay, Anita. I don't mind being a nerd. But if this makes you happy, then you have my full support. My sweet, naive Barb has no idea how incredible being cool would be. They're the cool kids here, aka celebrities. They're so dazzling and popular. And oh my god, who's that? He's so dreamy. So, I confidently strutted over to introduce myself to the whole group one. Ah! Luckily, no one seemed to notice my fall, or they just didn't care. <sighs> Anyways, this was only my first day here. I had loads of time to fit in with the celebrities, and then catch that hottie, who supposedly named Eric's attention. At first, the popular girls didn't notice me, but then a few days in, Lou, the celebrity's leader, had a lipstick emergency and I sprung to her rescue. See? I told you, this burgundy shade really pops against your cool undertone. Ruby Woo? That's so 2015, Ashley. You can put that away. And easy peasy, I became part of the group. They invited me to their parties, shopping trips, and spa days. It's like entering a completely new world. An extra shiny one. I got to sit with them at lunch where they Ubered low-calorie food. Normally, I had the same as them, but today my mom packed me a special sandwich with the moist maker, just like Ross's from Friends. Sorry, guys, but Anita doesn't share food. <laughs> Are you seriously going to drink that? You can practically see the fat and lactose swirling in it. Gross. Oh, okay. Looks like the moist maker would have to wait. I looked around and saw Barb sharing her mom's amazeballs mac and cheese with her new geeky friends. I've not spoken to Barb properly in weeks. We kept trying to reschedule as I had manicures with Lou, Haley's party, and all these ever after school shopping trips. Which kept getting so expensive. Aren't you gonna buy that? You haven't bought anything. Um, that's because I only wear tailor-made clothes made of Egyptian cotton or at least silk linen. Um, okay. In that case, you can be our assistant. Make sure you wear a cute cardigan tomorrow for a OOTD Instagram post. Ashley has made a list of the available colors. That's why I had to use all of my allowance on this cardigan. But it's fine. That's just how popular clicks have to be. And it's so nice of them to let me hang around. I proudly strutted alongside the celebs, looking just like one of them. Other students gobbed at us, and it sure felt good. But suddenly, this dizzy spell came over me. I started shaking and feeling cold, then pitch black. I woke up in the infirmary to Barb's worried face. Oh good, you're awake. It's no surprise you passed out. You aren't eating enough. What? I'm eating just fine. Besides, skinny is chic. I'm not arguing with you. You're lucky your head didn't hit the floor thanks to Eric. Eric saved me? He must have caught me like in a romantic movie. This diet is amazing. I wouldn't have been in Eric's arms without it. Later, I tried to thank him, but he put his headphones on and walked off. And I never saw him at any of the celeb's parties or anything. 
A hot guy like him is probably hanging out with an even cooler clique and interested in even more popular girls. I need to try harder. But my geeky side wasn't going to stay suppressed. One time, this guy slated Spider-Man 2099, my favorite character ever. Dude doesn't understand how the multiverse works, and his suit sucks. Are you kidding me? As if you know how it works, his suit incorporates Parker tech and has stealth features and exploding spider saucers. Okay, cool it, new girl. It's just some weirdo jumps around in spandex. Right, be cool. Cool kids didn't geek out over superheroes. Luckily, everyone else seemed distracted. I turned to look and saw them already flocked around some new kid with a huge backpack, a comic t-shirt, and jeans. Huh, it's like looking at middle school me. When I managed to get a closer look, I almost fell over in shock. It was Chelsea! Why would pretty popular Chelsea do a total 180 on her looks? I tried to avoid Chelsea, but then one time when I was trying to approach Eric, she appeared and he actually spoke to her. Does Chelsea know Eric? Since when? How come? Ah! Time stopped as I stared into his big dreamy eyes, but falling for each other again? <laughs> he might as well just stay in his arms. I quickly walked away and passed Chelsea. Our eyes met. Did she recognize me? She didn't say anything, but was that a smirk I saw? I needed to find out if Chelsea really recognized me, so I turned to Barb. It was a bit awkward, as we hadn't spoken in a while. But luckily, Barb was cool about it and said she'd try to find out. We chatted a bit, and then she asked me, We are still going to Comic-Con on the 7th, right? Yeah, of course. Can't wait. I was excited about Comic-Con until... A few days later, the celebrities had a big announcement. They were attending Conan Gray's concert on the 7th. Are you coming, or do you have some tragic nerdy convention to go to? Huh? That's oddly specific. I panicked and said yes to the concert. We had to give money to Asher the next day, and she would take care of purchasing everyone's tickets. But thanks to that overpriced cardigan, how am I supposed to afford this? Hmm, I guess there was one way to pay for it. Me and Barb's Comic-Con fund, which we'd been saving since middle school. I was only borrowing and would definitely pay it back. The following day, the celebs gathered to discuss the concert. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flustered-looking Barb. What about our plan? Did you just spend all your savings on some concert you don't even care about? I'm sorry, I promise I'll pay you back. I just needed some time. So, you spent my share too? How could you? I felt terrible. I never meant to upset my friend like that. I just really wanted to fit in. Only, after that day, I found myself miserable with the celebs. The more time I spent with them, the more things about them got me second-guessing this group's dynamic. For instance, they talked a lot about the importance of being eco-friendly, but ordered Uber Eats almost every day, and constantly brought new, cute, reusable straws in Stanley Cups. Moreover, it was always lose weight or the highway, and they even trash-talked their own group members behind their backs. I found myself often looking around for Barb and then feeling extra guilty. On my way home, I was dragging my feet, feeling awful, when I passed an appliance store. I saw some students from my school's robotics team struggling with their droid, so I gladly offered a hand. If you want my lunch money, take it, but please leave Gears Brosnan alone. We worked hard on it. I tried explaining that I just wanted to help, but they kept pushing me away. I stared down at myself and realized that I wasn't welcomed because I'd given up everything to look like a celebrity. However, I didn't feel like one. I'd stood by and let the celebs push everyone else around. Was this really the life I wanted? That weekend was supposed to be spa day with the celebs, so I went out to the mall to ask Lou for my concert ticket. I was going to sell it and pay Barb back. Only when I got there, I saw Chelsea with them, but she looked like her cool self again. Uh-oh, I better go. But too late, Chelsea caught me and told everyone. Guys, look who's here. Fun fact, Anita and I used to be friends back in middle school. Cover yourself in foundation all you want, but your nerdiness will still show. Everyone started laughing, and that's when it dawned on me. They were all in on Chelsea's plans to expose me. I wanted to leave, but I still needed my ticket back. Sure, you can have it back, but on one condition. Wash off your Chelsea disguise and go back to being pathetic little you again. And so they told me to wash my hair in this decorative basin in a lush store before everyone's confused eyes and their live streaming cameras. I swallowed my pride and did it for Barb. But afterward, Lou turned back on her word. Actually, I gave it to Chelsea. Tough luck. Oops, too bad I never agreed to the deal Lou made with you. I felt overcome with panic and shame. I ran and I bumped into someone. Eric! Seeing how upset I was, he took me for coffee and a chat. As soon as we sat down, I burst into tears and told him how I'd lost everything. My popularity, dignity, friends, 
It all started to fall apart when Chelsea turned up all of a sudden, and then the domino effect took over. Chelsea? I'd always known she's catty, but I never thought she'd go that far. How can you be friends with her? <laughs> what? No, it's not what you think. You still don't recognize me? What do you mean, recognize? Then he revealed that he was from my middle school. I was shooketh! But if I squinted real hard, I guess he did look vaguely familiar. Whoa, puberty hit you like a truck. Same for you. Yeah, no, it wasn't puberty for me. I got emotionally scarred from being an outcast and became afraid of missing out on cool stuff, so I turned myself into a Chelsea clone to be popular. That's insane. But if it means anything, I prefer the old you. It's great seeing you at the school. But when I saw that you changed and joined the celebs, I was kind of apprehensive. But for real, though, I would have died for you to notice me. I was beyond surprised. He liked me all along? Suddenly, Chelsea jumped in. Why has it always been her? I changed myself to look like her. Didn't you say you liked nerdy girls? So why not me? Say what? Chelsea liked Eric? So she really copied my look. And for that reason? I'm sorry, Chelsea, but it's my feelings. I can't believe you rejected me twice for this little nerd, and she doesn't even look like herself anymore. Chelsea, it's never been about looks. It's about who she is. In the midst of it, I finally understood something. I was fine just being me. I never needed to be anything else. I've switched schools and turned myself into a dork for you. Ah, you're lucky this time. I watched Chelsea stomp out. I realized how I was constantly anxious and on edge that I'd messed up while hanging out with the celebrities. I missed the truly happy moments with real friends where I could just be me. All this time, I thought I'd been missing out on all the fun, but turns out, I missed nothing. The true way to have beautiful teenage years is to spend it with people that really appreciate you and do the things that you actually enjoy. I thanked Eric, then left. There was something important I needed to do first. I went home and fixed my BB-8, then took it over to Barb's house. Sorry, Barb. I'm so sorry, Barb. I was so desperate to be cool that I overlooked what really mattered. I miss you and our friendship so much. I missed you too. And I saw that humiliating video and just wanted to know you were okay. On second thoughts, I'll forgive you if you give me your BB-8. <laughs> no can do, as I'm selling it online to make money to pay you back. I only brought it here to make my apology more meaningful. Did it work? We both hug. The next few days at school, I tried my best to fix things. I returned to my old image, well, with a slight upgrade. I can't let my beauty skills go to waste now. And I dug out all my geeky stuff. I showed up at the robotics club, and this time, I confidently strode over and immediately fixed their robot. I told you I could help. Don't judge a book by its cover. That's a celebrity's job. Look at you, all happy and smiley with your own loser nerd kind. Yeah, I'm happy, while you once tried and failed to be one of us, remember? Being a nerd isn't just about appearance, it's about what's inside. By the way, how was the concert? I heard your fanatic behavior got you kicked out. Sounds exciting. Chelsea and the celebs looked fuming as they sashayed off, but I didn't care, as I was finally back where I belonged. I was sound asleep when loud bangings jolted me awake. The cops busted in and immediately pinned me down. What are you doing? Let me go! Get away from me! Do you even know who I am? Rebecca Darlington, you're under arrest for stealing Mr. Woodley Jones's heirloom necklace. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Stealing? What? No, I didn't do it. Let me go. Man, I got into big trouble that time. Oh, hey guys, I'm Rebecca. Believe it or not, it's actually my bizarre life story here. Before we start, please like and subscribe. My dad passed away when I was only five, so my mom had to step up and take over the entire family business on her own. And she was the biggest perfectionist on the planet, not just in business, but in the family too. Seriously, it's her way or no way. I hated this and always tried to rebel. However, mom always found a way to ruin my fun and forced me to study business instead. Ugh, <sighs> boring. But lucky me, my brother, Kevin, always got my back. One morning over breakfast, mom decided to drop a bombshell on me. Rebecca, I've arranged you a date with Brian, the Woodley Jones's son. You are to go there for dinner and be on your best behavior. They are very affluent. They own half of the city. No chance. I'm not some pawn in your bid to gain business deals. If you ignore my orders, I'll transfer you to a boarding school all the way to Australia. You wouldn't. Don't test me, young lady. Perhaps you could arrange this date for another time when Rebecca has a time to digest it? 
If I wanted your input, I would have asked for it. He's my brother, and he has a say in this. Your adopted brother. It's about time he knows his place. Kevin looked so hurt, but still put a smile on for me. He's such an angel, just like his mom, Rosalie. Rosalie used to work here as a maid, and Kevin would often come play with me. But then she suddenly passed away, leaving Kevin all alone in this world. So mom adopted him out of pity. To me, Kevin's always been a family, and I will not let mom treat him like that. How about I let her have a taste of her own medicine? So I took mom's magic money card and went on a huge shopping splurge. Mom wouldn't be mad if her card missed a few zeros, right? Now let's get ready for the date. Ta-da! I look crazy, right? Take that, mom. No way will this Brian guy want a second date. Kevin kindly offered to drive me to my date. He reassured me it would be okay, then passed me a box of chocolates to give to Brian. Ugh, oh, Kevin. It was gone 9 p.m. when I strolled into the grand entrance hall of the Woodley Jones's mansion. Brian's jaw dropped to the floor as soon as he saw my crazy look. Oh, but I didn't stop there. I first asked all the servers to leave us alone, then made him nauseous with my table manners and wowed him with my big appetite. I even sneaked bites of the chocolates meant for him and playfully fed him some. After dinner, I asked him to give me a tour of the mansion. But by the time we reached the jewelry room, my head was spinning. Then everything went blurry and I blacked out. Out. The next morning, I was already back at my house without any memories of how I got back. Then these cops came in and arrested me. Now I'm in this interrogation room being accused of stealing the Woodley Jones necklace. Apparently, it was quite pricey and had been handed down through 12 generations. You were at the scene of the crime. If you want to prove your innocence, then I suggest you start telling me what happened. Like I said, I went there for dinner, then fainted, and somehow woke up in my bed with cops everywhere. Stop lying. Brian was the one who was drugged, during which time you cut off the power so you wouldn't be caught on CCTV, then stole the necklace, didn't you? Okay, Mr. Policeman. Daniel Wright, I know you're trying to play good cop, bad cop with me, so I'll get to the point. Let me go, and I will ask my mom to pay you handsomely. You know her, right? Head of the Darlington conglomerate? Are you trying to bribe to law enforcement? You could get seven years in jail for this, plus the robbery sentence. I can assure you it wouldn't be less than ten years. T ten years? I, I didn't mean to. I just freaked out. I I'm rich, okay? I have everything I want. I, I wouldn't risk stealing something like that. You did send all the staff home, so there is no one to corroborate your story. How exactly did you get home? I told you I blacked out. All I know is I didn't do anything wrong. You couldn't find the necklace at my place or on me either. You have no evidence against me. Then enjoy a stay in a cell for 24 hours, in which time I shall find the proof I need to lock you away for a very long time. Wait, no, please trust me. Someone, anyone. This was so unfair. I just wanted to go home. Fortunately, that cop couldn't find any proof and had to let me go. Finally, after 24 hours behind cold bars, unjustly accused, all I need right now is a warm welcome from Mom and Kevin and a nice bath. But what I got was a slap in the face. How could you steal from the Woodley Joneses? Now they'll never do business with me again. Mom, I didn't do it. Why does nobody believe me? Would you look at yourself? Have you done anything good for this family? All you ever did was party, throw my hard-earned money out the window, then dare to cross me. You're no daughter of mine. Get out, now! I was shocked and heartbroken by her words. My own mother wouldn't believe me? So, I walked out. Just you wait, Mom. I'll prove it to you. I'm no thief. With Kevin's help, I rented a place not too far from home, but it was nowhere near the luxury I was used to. No worries. Once I proved myself innocent, things would get better. Now I just had to find that police guy, Daniel, that arrested me. He must have insight on the case, right? But when I arrived at the police station, I saw Daniel being scolded by his boss. You couldn't even solve the simplest case. Daniel, what has gotten into you? You're off the case. Jack, it's over to you. Leave it with me, sir. I won't let you down. Like some incompetence. <laughs> Sheesh, that Jack guy was such a douchebag. And Daniel sure did look glum about all of this. So I approached him and suggested we work together to find the culprit and kick Jack in the butt. At first, he refused, as apparently a suspect participating in the investigation was not procedure. Relax, it's not like I want access to classified documents or anything. Think of it as working with a suspect. If we cooperate, you can monitor me to see if I really am the culprit. It's a win-win. It's not like that. I'm no longer on the case. Jeez, I didn't expect you to give up so easily. So much for being a pro. Maybe your boss was right to reassign the case. Huh, 
Who are you to judge me? You're still the number one suspect in this case, and I got my eyes on you, thief. So, is that a yes? Ugh, fine. Bingo. Surely there's no place better to hunt for clues than the crime scene, right? But Brian's mansion was locked down and had security everywhere. Luckily, Daniel told me he'd already studied the house's layout and knew that the only way to intrude without being noticed was through this door. Yes, folks, you heard it right. A dog door. The bar couldn't get any lower, could it? Just shut up. We sneaked through it and ended up in the staff kitchen. The main building has already been fully swept, as that's where we knew the main suspect was. The staff quarters weren't a focus point. Daniel launched into a CSI mode, checking the area for footprints, and I watched with fascination. He found a strange shoe print, which didn't belong to any of the staff, as they were required to wear uniform shoes. This type of shoe print is rare. This could be a big clue. I didn't want him to start accusing me again, so I wiggled my foot about. Ahem, <clears throat> it's obviously not my tiny size six feet. <laughs> I didn't say a thing about you. This obviously belonged to a man with size 12 feet. Is it your accomplice? Is he Bigfoot or something? Are you crazy? Who's accomplice, you madcap? Shush, are you trying to get us caught? Oopsie, just then, we heard running footsteps coming our way. Shoot, we gotta get out. The only escape is through this window. Again? Oh, what a burden. Daniel grabbed my hand, then we both jumped through the window. Smack! His shoe was right up my face. Ouch! Get your dirty foot off me! I tried getting up, and we ended up kissing. My, my first kiss. Wait, what is that sound? I turned around to see two big dogs growling at us. We run on the count of three, okay? One, just run! We ran straight to the road and caught a taxi, leaving behind those vicious dogs. Uh, your hand? Um... Oh, sorry. It was because of those dogs. Is being chased by dogs the in-trend? A few nights ago, I saw those exact two dogs chasing another man along this road. Daniel immediately asked the driver to show him his dashcam footage. It showed this tall, masked man in all black coming out of Brian's house. A shiver ran through me at the sight of him. There was something unsettlingly familiar. The next day, Daniel made me traipse into at least a dozen different shoe stores so he could ask the staff about the soul print we'd found last night, but no luck. The scorching sun was getting to me, so Daniel brought out this umbrella. Cute, huh? If only this big hole hadn't been directly above me. By lunchtime, I saw Daniel sweating in the heat, so I grabbed a tissue to wipe for him. The heat rose as we were so close, but once done, he was even more oily. <laughs> we're just like two peas in a pod. Later that day, we made it to this ancient shoe shop that said it was a Leighton, a brand that made customized handmade shoes. Wait, I've heard about that exclusive brand before, but... If someone could afford these shoes, why would they go out and about stealing? Daniel seemed to agree, and the investigation was at a dead end. The truth is, I had my suspicions about who the real thief was, so I went back to the crime scene to see if I could find any evidence. Daniel did say this dog door was the only other way in, so I searched around the area and spotted this shiny bracelet in a bush. Oh, I know who this belongs to. So, I've asked him to meet me here. I found your bracelet. Thank you so much. You know how important this is to me. The bracelet is a keepsake for my mom. She gave it to me before she passed away. I found it at Brian's house. The night you drove me to Brian's, did you go straight home afterward? Y yeah of course. I've been on the investigation for a couple of days and found that the thief wore size 12 latent shoes. I gave you a pair for your birthday. The thief was also identified by a taxi driver's dash cam as a male, around 5 foot 10, the exact body figure of you. And now, this bracelet? The coincidences are stacking up. But I can't believe it. Not without your explanation. After all, you are my brother. Yes, it was me, but I had no other choice. I actually have a sister, a half-sister from my dad's side, and she's going through surgery. I really needed the money to pay her bills. I might look successful on the outside, but I work for your mom unpaid. Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for all she's done for me, and I couldn't ask her for more, so I took the risk. Why didn't you tell me? I can help you. You were always embroiled in arguments with your mom, so I don't want to burden you further. And you only seem to need me when you're in trouble. That's true. Thinking back, we rarely talked. Even when we talked, it was always me complaining about mom to him without realizing mom has been the hardest on him. I hated what he did, but I knew he only did it to save his sister. And I felt terrible that I'd had Kevin's love and care all of these years, and she hadn't. Kevin, don't worry. Just leave it to me. 
The next day, Daniel came to see me and told me the police department had just found new evidence against me. The chocolates I'd given to Brian that night contained anesthetics. It all sounds very suspicious to me and may just change the direction of my investigation. Are you investigating me now? No, it's highly possible that the real culprit wanted to target you. I need your cooperation. We have to hurry before they blame it all on you. Who helped you prepare the present that day? No one. I bought them at the store. I felt awful lying to Daniel, but I couldn't let Kevin go down for this. Not when his sister needed him. It was time for me to put an end to this devastating chain of events. I went to the police station and confessed to stealing the necklace. They arrested me, and right at that moment, Daniel stepped in, surprised. Rebecca, what are you doing here? Let her go! What are you doing? We can't arrest her without evidence. Daniel, it's okay. I already confessed. What? That's nonsense. I insisted that I did it, and he had no choice but to let them arrest me. I know it's not that simple, Rebecca, and I'm going to prove it. Daniel was right. Everything was off about this trial. First, this Jack guy had somehow swapped all the evidence against Kevin to me. From my shoe prints on the staff kitchen to the recording from the taxi driver. Plus, the necklace was later found in Miss Rebecca Darlington's bedroom. It was never there in the first place. I wanted to speak up for myself, but that douchebag Jack shut me up. The judge was about to sentence me when Daniel kicked the door and barged in. Stop, Your Honor. I believe all the evidence presented to you was faked by him. The whole court bursted out in surprise. Turns out Daniel's boss had suspected Jack was a rotten apple, so he actually wanted to use this chance to expose him. He pretended to kick Daniel out of the case and appointed Jack instead to lure him into the trap. As predicted, after I confessed to the crime, Daniel followed Jack and saw that he was taking bribes from Kevin. Well paid. I'll fake the evidence. Rebecca will go down for this. Don't mess it up. It's tricky enough to get that brat to take the blame for me. He played me? There was no half-sister who's in the hospital? Ugh, don't look at me like that. My real mom only died because of your mom, Don Darlington. That woman flagrantly accused her of stealing. Mom was so distraught, she had a heart attack and and passed away. Don only adopted me out of guilt, and she treated me like garbage, making me run around for you. So I decided to take revenge, show them how being wrongly accused of something can ruin lives. But look where vengeance got him. He was a monster, and I really wondered, was it really worth it? In the end, both Jack and Kevin went to jail. Unfortunately, without Kevin as key personnel to help out with my family business, it went into turmoil. So I offered to help mom with it. You do that, after everything I put you through. We're a family. I also felt bad for taking you and what you provide me for granted. I'm so ashamed of how I treated you. I've been cold, controlling, and unfair. On you and Kevin. It's my fault he turned against us and sought revenge. Mom, it must have been hard for you running the business and caring for me and Kevin. Especially without Dad. I forgive you and want to just put it behind us and start again. Now, I just had one last person to make amends with. Rebecca, I... I didn't think you'd ever want to see me again. I didn't. I was so mad, but then I realized that being that way was getting me nowhere. To forgive others means forgiving and liberating ourselves. I walked out of the prison feeling much more positive about it all and saw Daniel waiting for me. Say, we make a good team. What do you think about being my partner? Partner? For investigative purposes or for life? Hmm, how about both? Why is there a hole here? Could it be that the ends did it? What if they're secretly planning an attack on human beings? Hmm, what will happen to the Big Mac? Elaine, does staring at the hole help you figure out the sphere volume? What class is it? Have you been paying attention at all? Have you? Because if you have, you would have known the answer yourself. Excuse me? Oh, wait. Nah, I still don't know. Sorry, what were you saying? This is going to be in the test. You need to focus if you... Oh! This is Japanese class! Duh! That's it. We're going to the principal's office. And that's the huge of my high school life. Hi, my name's Elaine, and I've been living with ADHD since... I don't know. But of course, ADHD manifests itself differently among different people. For me, I just gotta make sure I take my medication... Wait, where's my birth certificate? Anyway, make sure to like and subscribe before I continue. Right after the principal's office visit, I was walking down the hallway when a hunky guy purposely bumped into me, knocking my bag over. Dude, is that a dinosaur? Are you a kindergartner? 
Hey, that's my fidget toy. Give it back. Whoops, finders keepers. Who dares mess with my friend? It's Quinn, the Furious Queen. Run! The two guys immediately ran for their lives. Right then, Skylar and her new boyfriend also headed over. Isn't she the weirdo from the math class? Don't tell me you're friends with her. Yes, I am indeed. You can only choose one, her or me. How about I dump you instead? Get lost. And these are my girls. We've been best friends since forever and always got each other's backs. I forget my stuff a lot and Quinn always makes sure I got everything with me before leaving any place. While Skylar has me covered every time I dozed off in class. You know, I can't sleep at night because I'm busy thinking about the Ant's Earth destruction plan. Hmm, maybe they're the ones who terminated the giant dinosaurs. Wait, where was I? I don't know. Rewind the video yourself. Valentine's Day soon arrived. Even though Skylar just broke up with her boyfriend, she already had loads of presents from other guys. And so did Quinn. My girls are hot. What about you, Elaine? Nothing this year yet? Nah, I don't care. You guys are all I need. How about you make a move? Any guy you've laid your eyes on? Talk about making a move. When are you going to tell Cromer you've got the biggest crush on him? That's right. Give it a try today, Quinn. I… I don't care. I can get any guy if I want to. Right. Suit yourself, girl. That afternoon, we were walking when we heard an announcement from the school's radio station. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Malcolm from iHeartRadio. Today, we got a special request from… someone anonymous delivered to… Elaine Miller. Love the way you stared at the hole on the desk that day in math class. It was so cute. I wish I could be that hole instead. Happy Valentine's Day. Someone's got a crush on you, Elaine. You've got a secret admirer. See, someone likes you for who you are. Always stay true to yourself. I wonder who this is. OMG, I gotta find out. But didn't you say you don't care? That's right. But now the game has changed. <laughs> who could it be? They mentioned math class, so they must attend the same class as we do. That's it. All we need is the attendance list from Mr. Wilson's office. But we can't go in there. Ever heard of mission I'm possible? Girls, it's showtime. After class, we waited for Mr. Wilson to leave his office. Then, just like totally spies, we crawled onto the floor, successfully avoided the security guard's gawking eyes, and managed to hide from one of the teachers passing by. Then continued secretly advancing toward Mr. Wilson's office. Oh, look! They got flaming hot Cheetos now! Elaine! Elaine. After we got the list, I immediately texted a bunch of people to test it out and anxiously waited. But some people replied calling me crazy. Others reported me to Instagram. I even got a visit from the police because they thought I was some creep sliding into people's DMs. Once they left, I immediately FaceTimed the girls. Hmm, from the list, there's still Malcolm you haven't texted. Isn't he working at the radio station with you, Skylar? Yeah, we are working together, but it can't be him. He never asked me about Elaine before. Who knows? You weren't working at the radio station today, were you? My money's on him, Elaine. What should I do? I can't send messages on Instagram anymore. How about writing to him? You know, the old-fashioned way. So I prepared a love letter for Malcolm and even designed a cute envelope for it. But then I got too invested in designing the envelope, I forgot all about the letter. When I finally remembered the letter, I walked all the way back for it. But of course, my ADHD brain had to mess it up again. Not until the day when Quinn and Skylar came over and I couldn't find my doctor's envelope anywhere did I realize I'd sent Malcolm my ADHD prescription instead of the letter. We immediately flew to Malcolm's house just as the mailman dropped off the prescription envelope out front. Seeing Malcolm walking out, I frantically ran to the other side of the street and started doing the craziest dance to get Malcolm's attention. Suddenly, I tripped and fell flat on my face. Malcolm rushed to help me up and got me inside his house. We chatted a bit as Malcolm worked on my arm. Elaine, right? We share a few classes together. We do? Yeah, you always sit near Quinn and Skylar, right? I saw you snoozing in class sometimes. Um, I guess so. Look, Malcolm, did you give me the message on the radio? Ah, the confession. Well, it's not me. I'm not your secret admirer. But that doesn't mean I don't have a chance, do I? Skylar talks a lot about you, and I've always wanted to talk to you in person. Um, speaking of Skylar, it's our girls' night tonight. Bye! And thank you. I finally managed to calm my hyperactive heart down when I got back to my room. Is Malcolm the secret admirer? He's not. How embarrassing. See, told you. We're pretty close. He would have told me already. But he seems to like me. Really? I mean, I saw the way he helped you up when you fell. 
it can't be. Let's focus on finding your real secret admirer. But that doesn't mean I can't hang out with Milkham while finding my secret admirer. Turned out we both shared a passion for hip hop. He can make super catchy beats for me to rap. Ahem, <laughs> just kidding. Animated story show wouldn't let me. Comment down below if you want a separate video of me rapping. Since then, we started hanging out more often. Malcolm is such a caring and patient person. Sometimes my ADHD kicked in and I cut him off while he was speaking, but he never got mad and just patiently waited for me to finish. Another time when I was blabbing nonstop about whatever was in my mind, I saw him counting. What are you counting for? How many times you switch topics within two minutes? Oh, sorry. No need to. I find it cute, actually. Later on, as we parted ways, I saw Skylar waiting for me, looking a little sad. Hey, what's wrong? I'm gonna be honest with you, because we promised each other. I've actually had a crush on Malcolm ever since we started working together at the radio station. What about your recent boyfriend? Oh, it was just a fling. I just can't stand seeing you with Malcolm. Anyway, don't take it personally. Sorry, I gotta go. Skylar had a crush on Malcolm? But I, I do enjoy being with him. No, sisters first. But it wasn't easy, as Malcolm would always try to approach me. It hurt having to stay away from him. Every time he got close, my heart would beat like crazy. But I also don't want to upset Skylar, as she started distancing herself from me and Quinn. I actually quite like Malcolm. This is so complicated. I honestly don't know what to tell you. How about you try finding your secret admirer? For real this time. He might be a better suit than Malcolm. The next morning, I found a note in my locker. From your secret admirer? They want to meet me near the fountain. But when I got there, I saw another note asking me to come to the bleacher. This better not be some silly prank. When I arrived, I was shocked to see Cromer sitting there by himself. He can't be behind the notes, right? Guess I'll find out now. Just a little closer. Closer. Suddenly, he looked up and stared straight into the camera. I was about to run when he caught me. Hey, Elaine Miller, right? You could have asked me for a picture. Didn't know you have a thing for me. No, no, I... I... It was an accident! Since then, I made sure to be more discreet to see if Cromer was the secret admirer. But man, it's like this guy got the sixth sense or something. Hey, what's wrong? You look nervous. It's because she likes me. She even tried to take pictures of me, right, Elaine? It's okay. I noticed you watching me recently. Come on, just admit it. I know I'm irresistible. Haha. <laughs> Why are you doing this? You know I like him. No, no, let me explain. You know, I even thought it was a misunderstanding between you and Skylar. But you know what? Now it seems like you just want to steal from us. Hey, guys, chill out. What's going on? You chill out. Do you even know Elaine said she liked Malcolm too? And now she's also taking Cromer. My Cromer. Hey, about Cromer, it's not what you think. And Malcolm, it's not like you and him are a thing. I have as much of an equal chance as you do, don't you think? Then why were you following him just then? And you even took pictures of him? And we're talking about our chance with Malcolm now? I, I, you know it's unfair to me. Unfair? We're always trying to make sure to put you first, but now you think you're the victim? I can't do this anymore. I hope you're happy you got both guys now, best friend. That was too much. They acted as if they took pity on me. I don't need anyone to look after me. I'm all fine by myself. Since we fell out, we're all caught up with our own things. Whenever I passed by Skylar, she just gave me a cold look. Quinn also seemed to have found new joys. I managed to get by just fine, but it felt like something was missing. One time, I was walking when I spotted Skylar and Malcolm surrounded by a crowd. Turned out, Skylar confessed having a crush on Malcolm and asked him out, but he rejected her. The crowd couldn't miss the chance to mock her. Suddenly, I remembered how Skylar used to stand up for me, and I felt so bad for her. So, I decided to defend her this time, but she just ran out of there. I tried to catch up with her, but Skylar wouldn't listen. Suddenly, she crossed the street without looking, and a car came crashing into her. I frantically ran to check on her, and we immediately got her to the ER. Thank God she was fine. Just a couple bruises and scratches, but she refused to let me in. That night, I tried to call Quinn, but it kept sending me to voicemail. But I've made up my mind. I kept ringing her bell and insisted on waiting till she showed up. She finally gave in. Hey, I'm sorry for- Oh, you're sorry for me? No need to take pity on me. Just enjoy your happiness. Malcolm rejected me because he chose you. Happy much? Now just leave me alone, you ruthless, self-centered. Then she slammed the door shut in front of me, leaving me all stunned there. Ha, <laughs> what a show. This should totally be on Netflix. Cromer, why are you here? 
I live right next door, so I see Skylar doesn't want to see you. But I do. Get off of me! I never liked you! Are you playing hard to get now, pretty little thing? Right then, Malcolm appeared out of nowhere and bolted to punch Cromer in the face. Didn't you hear what she said? Leave her alone! Can't believe Quinn and I are arguing because of you, creep! If only Quinn knew who her crush truly was! Quinn likes me? Huh, could have told me earlier. What else is he up to? Anyway, thank you. Why are you here? I heard Skylar got into an accident right after the, uh, incident, so I wanted to pay her a visit. Now that you're here, I just want to let you know, uh, actually, the one sending you the confession on the radio that day was... Skylar. What? She just wanted you to feel loved and not left alone on Valentine's Day. I was going to give it some time before telling you, but things got... complicated all too quickly. Anyway, now that you don't have to find out who your secret admirer is anymore, would you want to go out with me? As a girlfriend, I mean? Malcolm, I do like you a lot, but I just can't bring myself to hurting Skylar ever again. I'm sorry. Ugh, it's okay. I understand. Guess I'll see Skylar another time then. I'm so sorry, Malcolm. Later, I arrived home to Mom packing some boxes. Can you check if you still need these from the attic? Otherwise, they have to go. I opened up the boxes to find old pictures of me, Skylar, and Quinn inside, and I immediately burst into tears. We looked so happy together, like nothing could split us apart. That's right, we're sisters. I gotta make things right. The next day, after the first period, I came looking for Skylar. Gosh, I'm so anxious. Where's my fidget toy? What if Skylar's still mad at me? Looking for this? Y yes Skylar, I need to talk- Me too. I'm sorry, Elaine. Ugh, I was so hurt and embarrassed yesterday that I said nasty things to you. And you were right. I should have told you earlier I have a crush on Malcolm. But after everything, I realized how stupid I was and I don't want to lose you or lose us. Hey, me too. I couldn't sleep yesterday after hearing about everything from Skylar. I haven't been myself without you guys. Oh, me neither. You guys mean the world to me. It turned out, Skylar also gave me the locker notes that day. She said she wanted me to give up on finding the secret admirer, and Cromer just happened to be there. After that, I also told Quinn and Skylar about the fight between Cromer and Malcolm that night, when Cromer himself showed up. Hey, Quinn! I just realized I've always liked you. I'm sorry your friend Elaine liked me, but you are my perfect match. Be my girlfriend, will you? Skylar and I immediately gave each other a worried look, when Cromer, you know what Lady Gaga would say? Caught in a bad romance? I know I'm too handsome. You can't resist. She'd say, Women stick together, you jerk. Cromer immediately ran away in embarrassment. <laughs> what a loser. Oh, by the way, Malcolm left to study abroad today and he sent his goodbye to you. I feel so bad about you and Malcolm. It's okay. Right person, wrong time. From then on, us three were always by each other's side and graduated together. We even went to the same college now and made sure we go to every party together. One night at a music festival, I was waiting for Skylar and Quinn to get back from the restroom when they started playing Kendrick Lamar. Hip-hop would always remind me of someone now. Suddenly, a handkerchief was handed to me. I saw you from afar. Is this the right time to get your number now? I was tidying up my room when a call came through. Oh, my big sister! She lives with mom, so I've not seen her in a year. Blair! It's been a hot minute. How have you been? Hi, Karenin. Well, not so good. Mom laughed. Oh no! What happened? Then Blair told me it's due to mom's debts. She had run away from the loan sharks and left my sister behind. That's awful! So I told her to come to Portland and live with us. She agreed to come, but then I realized that Blair staying here wasn't really down to me. Oh well, it's not like I could leave her in danger, right? So, later over dinner, I told my family about Blair's current situation. Oh, how terrible! Yes, Blair must come and stay. Yay! Their kindness didn't surprise me as my stepmom and stepsis, Chrissy, have been lovely to me ever since I moved in. You know what's even cooler? Christy is a rising teen pop star, but she's so sweet! We've grown super close, and she even told me all about her secret boyfriend, Damien. They'd been together long before Chrissy became famous, and had since kept their relationship out of the public eye. This is so exciting! I haven't seen Blair since our parents split! This guest bedroom is gonna be hers, and we're living under one roof again! Blair's basically my alter ego. She's pretty, outgoing, and popular, while I'm more of a homebody. 
Come to think of it, I see a lot of Blair and Chrissy. They're both so extroverted and confident. They'll get along just great. But to everyone's surprise, Blair showed up looking completely different. Wow, it seems like living with Mom, a party animal, had clearly influenced Blair. Hello, Blair. I'm Stacy, and this is my daughter Chrissy. Welcome to Portland. You must be tired from your trip. Let me take your bag. Sure. Huh? Doesn't it seem like everyone's excited about Blair's arrival, all except for Blair? Maybe she's just tired. I showed Blair her room and helped her unpack. Oh my god, they're unbearable. How can you stand living with them? They think they're so much better than everyone else. What? Blair had only spoken to them for five seconds. Why she disliked them so much already? Give them a chance, they're really lovely. Blair's probably just stressed out from all the mom stuff. Hopefully with time, she'll see how great stepmom and Chrissy are. Only things didn't get any better. After class, both Chrissy and Blair came up to me. Hey, hey wanna, wanna hang, hang out? out? I asked her first. Oh, then we can all go together. Sorry, Chrissy. It's just that we haven't seen each other in ages and there's a lot of catching up to do. Maybe we can go to Sephora tomorrow to check out that new Anastasia palette you like. Sure, have fun. Then Chrissy left. I'm sure she really wants us all to hang out. Oh, please. She thinks just because she's popular, she can always get her own way. She's mid. Okay, maybe it's best not to mention either of my sisters to one another to avoid World War III. Things went on like that for a while. I took turns to hang out with Blair and Chrissy. Once when Blair was chilling in my room, I noticed her smiling at her phone. Seemed like our homegirl had finally found something fun to enjoy around here. I excitedly asked her what she was watching. Look, isn't he cute? He goes to our school also. Wait, no, it can't be. That's Damien, Chrissy's secret boyfriend. If Blair learns that the girl she hates is her crush's girlfriend, all hell will break loose. I think I'll ask him out. Really? He's so popular, he must have hundreds of girls wrapped around his finger already. Besides, what if he's not into you? You'll only be rejected and get hurt. What do you mean? Am I not pretty enough? Oh, I see. You think that a popular guy like him is only suitable for your famous, fabulous other sister, Chrissy, don't you? No, no, that's not what I mean. You're gorgeous. In fact, out of his league. You deserve a guy who has time just for you. So why bother competing for attention from someone like him? Okay, thanks, but he's my type. I'll ask for his number Monday morning. Oh no, I just accidentally encouraged Blair to ask out Chrissy's boyfriend. I can't reveal that Chrissy and Damien are secretly together, but I can't let Blair steal someone else's boyfriend neither. What a mess. I tossed and turned all night. Then when I woke up, I decided I'd just have to make Blair stop liking Damien. I don't condone catfishing, but right now it's the only way. Hey there, Blair, right? It's Damien here from math class. What you doing? A few seconds later, Blair replied, Oh my god, I was just thinking about getting your number. Looks like the first steps of my plan are working. I texted Blair as Damien regularly. I made sure he was a man of a thousand red flags. But for some puzzling reason, Blair seemed smitten with him. I gave him a seriously challengeable temperament. He could throw a tantrum one moment and become sweet the next. Then I photoshopped Damien's selfie into a photo of a messy bedroom, then sent it to Blair. Surely she couldn't abide by a narcissistic, messy guy like him. I'm so sorry, Damien, but I have to save my family. Huh? What? She sent back a picture of her room being messier than ever. She's always the clean freak around here. I had to see with my own eyes. Hey, may I borrow your hair curler? And what's with your room? So what if it's a bit untidy? Neat people are total psychos. Okay, it's time to get personal. Blair's biggest pet peeve was being commented on her look. So when she sent Damien a selfie, I didn't hold back. Babe, can't you dress more ladylike? And you really should cover up that awful tattoo. Voila, that's how you wake up the beast inside this fierce girl. <laughs> However, the next day, Blair showed up with a completely new look. Worse still, she walked straight over to Damien. I had to fake having an emergency to prevent a disaster from happening. Afterward, I texted Blair. I'm not ready to let everyone know about us yet. Please understand, babe. You know I like you. There, that should stop her from trying to approach him again. Even so, during lunch, Blair wouldn't stop blabbering about Damien and showing me his text. Isn't he quite rude? You don't normally let guys tell you what to do. He's not. He's just opinionated. I'm into that. No, he's horrible. I don't understand why you like him. He's sweet. You just don't know him like I do. Our love is complicated, but that's what makes it special. Seriously, you called that love? What do you know? Okay, little Miss Love Guru, if you're really that experienced, make that guy your boyfriend. Succeed, and I'll give out the love of my life. If not, I'll do as I please. 
What Blair is daring me to do was impossible! That guy, Adrian, is as popular as Damien. While Damien's the friendly one, Adrian is nicknamed Jack Frost due to his icy cold exterior. Rumor has it, no one has ever seen him crack a smile. Surrender? As expected. Then step aside, sister. Not knowing what else to do, I agreed to the bet. This is for Blair, for Chrissy, for Dad's happiness. Hi, Adrian, right? I, I, I'm, uh, are you free tonight? Or whenever? He gave me this cold glance, then went back to chatting with Damien. Please, I'm just trying to win a bet with my sister. One smile from you is enough to save the fate of an entire family and stop two girls becoming homeless. Can you just- Adrian gave me this odd look. Then he burst out laughing and took my hand. Sure thing. Can't wait for our date tonight. I left in a haze of confusion. That really just happened? Adrian must be messing around. But nope, he actually showed up at my doorstep that evening. This meant I'd won the bet, right? So I called Blair over to show her, but she just brushed it off. That proves nothing. Talk to me when Ice Boy professes his love for you. Man, I guess this means I'm going on a date. The tension in here was palpable, so I decided to break the awkward silence. Hey, where are we going? I mean, this isn't actually a real date, is it? It's definitely real. You insisted. I must have looked so dazed that he continued. Don't worry, I'm not messing with you. Anyway, I think you'll like where I'm taking you. I used to think he was incapable of smiling, but turns out he looks even cuter when he does. A drive for cinema? Wow! I'd seen these in old movies, but I had no idea it still existed. So, what's the deal with your sister Chrissy? You mentioned the bet? You know that Chrissy is my sister? Of course, it's not exactly hidden. Besides, I'm friends with Chrissy's boyfriend. So, you know? Yep, there's no secrets between me and Damien. And don't worry, I have his back. So, can you answer my question now? <laughs> I like this different side to Adrian. So before I could stop myself, I told him how the bet wasn't with Chrissy, but with my other sister, Blair. And I was catfishing Blair as Damien to protect my family, but it's barely working. Whoa, that's intense. Secrets make things complicated. Life sure would be easier if we could just be ourselves. So, why did you decide to go on a date with me? Don't you think it's weird? <laughs> no, not really. Beats how girls normally ask me out. I arrived home feeling on cloud nine, but then I walked past Chrissy's room and saw her upset. I asked her what's going on. It's Damien. He wants us to go public, but I told him I'm not ready yet. I like having this part of me private, and I don't want Damien to be open to backlash and scrutiny. But he didn't understand and thought I was embarrassed of him. Oh, Chrissy, what a pain. Give him time, I'm sure he'll come around. But the school performance is in a few days. How am I supposed to take the stage in this state? I hated seeing Chrissy so downhearted like this. And I thought about Adrian and what he said during our date about honesty. I don't know much about the pressures of fame, but I do know that your feelings for Damien are real. I don't think love is something that you should hide. Honesty is the best policy. It might be hard at first, but you can get through it together. Now, come to my case, I should also follow my own advice and put an end to my catfishing before it gets out of hand. I tried hard to think of the best way to break this to Blair while we were walking to school the next day. After much hesitation, I pulled her aside before entering school for a talk. Only, before I could get to the main part, Damien walked past and oddly, Blair didn't do so much as to blink. Seeing my confusion, she said, Yesterday, he ignored all of my messages. You're right, I deserve someone better. Anyway, what did you want to tell me? Oh, that, um, my date with Adrian was amazing. It all happened because of you. So, thanks. And sorry about Damien. It's okay. That's strange. Did my smitten sister really just give up that easily? But anyway, at least it's all over now. And <sighs> I don't even have to come clean anymore. The day of Chrissy's performance arrived. Me, Adrian, and Damien had backstage access. Actually, I'm here for emotional support as Chrissy is about to tell everyone about her relationship with Damien. This is a surprise for Damien too. He just thinks we're here to get a better view of Chrissy. <laughs> she slays the performance and the audience adored her. Thanks everyone, thank you so much. Actually, today is an extra special day because I have something. But suddenly Blair stormed onto the stage and snatched Chrissy's mic. How about making it even more special with this breaking news? Everyone, she's had a secret boyfriend all this time. She made the poor guy hide in the shadow so she can keep her squeaky clean image. She's lied to you all for years. Is someone like that worthy of your support? Blair ran off as soon as she finished. Boos start coming from the crowd. Many people began commenting on the situation in true TMZ fashion. 
What is this, 2009 VMA? No way, my Chrissy is taken? Meanwhile, Chrissy had a panic attack and froze there on the stage. I didn't know what to do, neither did Damien. Luckily, Adrian kept calm and grabbed the walkie-talkie, connected to Chrissy's in-ear. Chrissy, listen to me. In times like these, there's only one way out, and that's confronting the truth and taking back the narrative. I looked at Adrian and realized something about my own problem. More on that later. For now, let's see how Chrissy handles this. Well, there goes my big reveal. Yes, I'm in a relationship, but I only kept it quiet because I wanted to separate my personal life from my professional one. Being a public figure and a teenager at the same time is not as easy as you might think. So I didn't want to drag my loved one into that life too soon. On reflection, maybe this wasn't the best way to deal with this. I won't hide anything from my fans anymore, and those who truly support me won't judge or speak badly of my decision. Everyone, I want you to meet Damien, my boyfriend. The audience went wild! Aww, this is so cute! But I still had one more problem to deal with. Blair! I look everywhere and finally found her hiding under the bleaches. Blair, it's just me. Please come out. I started to talk about what just happened, but Blair didn't want to hear it. I know everything! You tricked me because you think I'm an idiot! La 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 la! I let her finish her outburst and calm down. Then I apologized and told her the truth. I only did it because I didn't want you going after a boy who's already taken. I know, I went about it in a completely wrong way, but I just wanted to keep our family together. I love you and I don't want to be in the middle of your jealousy towards Chrissy anymore. If you just gave her a chance, you could have just been honest with me. This is all because you prefer Chrissy over me, don't you? No, of course not. I just wanted to protect you and for there to not be any more conflict between you and Chrissy. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Actually, I'm not jealous of Chrissy because she's famous and gorgeous. It's actually because you guys are really close. We used to be that close when our parents divorced, and now it's like I've been replaced. Blair's honesty touched me in the feels. I gave her a big hug, but then realized that we weren't alone. Actually, I'm jealous of you, Blair. You're all Kieran and Eva talks about, and I feel that even though we're close, I can't compete with her real sister. Oh, so the tension between them wasn't just over a boy. It was actually over me. To me, you're both my real sisters, and I love you dearly. Come on, sisterly cuddle. Oh, by the way, how did you know that I was pretending to be Damien? I overheard your conversation with Chrissy. It didn't take much digging around to figure out it was you texting me, not the real Damien. While we're at it, I find it worrying you were still into him after all those red flags. In future, please let me vet your dates first. You're too easily blinded by good looks. Oh dear, that's why us girls have to stick together, especially when it comes to boys.